Hello and welcome to From Rewatch with Love, a James Bond cinematic rewatch podcast. My name is Graham Stark, and I'm here with Matt Wiggins. Hi! And today, we are back on the mainline productions of the Eon Bond films after last episode's fun diversion into the weirdness of the Casino Royale parody movie. And we are looking today at 1969's There's a Lot to Unpack Here. (laughs) I'm sorry, I'll read that again. 1969's On Her Majesty's Secret Service. Wow. This there I have a lot to talk about today. I don't know about you, man. Good. I'm I'm glad. I mean, I'm here to do the normal. I'm here to to provide a framework for you to deliver the trivia. <laughs> oh, I'm not even talking about trivia. Sure, there's lots of interesting trivia and stuff, but I have a lot to talk about. This is a movie. I'm j- just there this is interesting on a lot yeah. of different angles. All right, I'm I'm interested to see where this goes for you. I yeah, I, I don't feel like my opinions are going to be as as involved as yours on this one. So I'm I'm looking forward to seeing what you've got for us today. So made in 1969 for a budget of seven million dollars, which is 49 million adjusted for inflation. That is down from the last movie, which is interesting because You Only Live Twice was still a big success, but we're going down from 9.5 to seven million probably largely as a result of Sean Connery leaving the franchise. He was done, you know, five movies. He was starting to get pretty sick of it at the end. A lot of the press was starting to irritate him, particularly working on You Only Live Twice. A lot of the Japanese press really hounded him while they were on location in Japan. You know, mm-hmm. the, there was instances where he was offset, not filming dressed very casually and someone some reporter asked him you know is this how james bond dresses and he was just like i'm not james bond you need to like you need to get this through your head and so he was he was done spoilers he's not done but he he was done (laughs) he's not even done for the last like the second to last time (laughs) no exactly so they had to find a new james bond and there were many names that were floating around Much like the original casting of Sean Connery, there are so many apocryphal stories about different people who were offered the role. There's a story that a very young Timothy Dalton would be offered the role of James Bond, but that he felt at the age of 22 that he was too young for it. And Timothy Dalton would indeed later play James Bond in the mainline movies. Many, you know, many other names sort of being thrown around, but eventually they settled on an almost total unknown in George Lazenby, an Australian car salesman and male model who had got some amount of television recognition as the man in the big fry commercials god what was big fry it was a brand of turkish delight it was certainly uh fry's chocolate cream Uh, thank you yes i i had to scroll down the wikipedia page but apparently it was fry's chocolate cream yeah and now my parents were convinced for the longest time that he was the cadbury milk tray man but that was a different <laughs> series of commercials with a very James Bond parody-esque style of ad where there was like a man on a train who would like sweep in from the roof of the train and be like, I have this tray of chocolates for some lady. But no, that was that was not George Lazenby. George Lazenby was, he was just, he was a pretty face in commercials. He didn't act or hadn't acted. And there's the story of basically that he went to London. He went to Sean Connery's tailor, asked them to do him up a suit like they would do for Sean Connery. And the guy said, well, I mean, it'll take six weeks, but I've got one here that I made for him that they didn't pick up. You could just buy this one. (laughs) So he got a suit that was made for Sean Connery, went to Sean Connery's barber and got the same haircut. Apparently, and this is corroborated by all parties, apparently was in the barber getting a haircut at the same time that Cubby Broccoli was also in there getting his haircut. (laughs) Amazing. And then sort of, you know, socially engineered his way past the front door secretary at Eon Productions and, you know, swaggered in with not zero arrogance, you know, and saying, I hear you're looking for a new James Bond. And Harry Saltzman, apparently, as George Lazenby tells it, was on the phone with his feet up on the desk, no socks or shoes on. And Saltzman sort of looked him up and down while on the phone and then gestured to his chair you know just sort of pointed at his chair like sit down but he had his nude feet up on the chair and Lazenby was like uh and so just 
turned away and walked over to the window and waited until Saltzman was off the phone. And then he put the phone down and was like, all right, come and sit down now. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, he felt like he got a little bit of little bit of respect from that he had this sort of this air of like, what's up? I'm James Bond. And I mean, that was enough for them. And you hear a lot about how it's like, well, George Lazenby, of course, you know, he was he obviously wasn't a good James Bond. I mean, the movie didn't do very well and they only ever used him once. So, you know, obviously the fault of the failure of this movie, you know, lies at George Lazenby's feet. And I absolutely do not believe that, that is the case. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you. First of all, this was not a box office failure. It did not make as much as previous Bond movies. It still made $82 million in its day. Right. Which, for reference, is $576 million. So it's like right. you're, you're working on a pretty big bell curve to call this movie a financial failure. I mean, you think in, in the context of like, I don't know, solo is maybe the best example like you're taking a character that's been played by one person for five films over the course of a decade and you then recast that actor even today that's a risk right like there's yeah. just the possibility that that like audiences at the time are not gonna accept them and i think that is borne out in the critical response to this movie at the time it came out but it, it it's risky to do and so i think i think expecting a step back in box office from that even if it turns out that the actor is great and you carry on until such a point as the idea of a recast is ingrained in the franchise you should expect to stumble there i i don't know if the like if subsequent mm -hmm. recasts like i haven't looked into it so i don't know if the subsequent recasts in the bond franchise led to the same kind of step back or if it got over it over time but I would I get the sense that that the recast here this is where they took that hit, and yeah. uh, and and that like was attributed to Lazenby's fault as opposed to just like no actually it's really hard to recast somebody. <laughs> yeah, and so like at the top of this episode, I, I want to come out and say I think George Lazenby is great as James Bond. Yeah, like I think in this movie he absolutely nails it, and his co-star Diana Rigg, who I mentioned previously was on the Avengers with Patrick McNee. And I mean, I'm extremely biased because I watched a lot of Avengers reruns <laughs> growing up, but I think Diana Rigg is terrific, like yeah. just generally, but also in this. Yeah. And, th and the thing is, it's weird, right? It's like, so why was on Her Majesty's Secret Service, you know, if, if George Lazenby is such a good James Bond, actually, and Diana Rigg is in this, and Telly Savalas is playing the bad guy. Why was this movie so bad? And so I have two parts to that. One, it's not. This movie's not bad. Yeah. This movie is actually <laughs> kind of terrific. But yeah. the areas in which it is bad, the areas in which it stumbles, I point to the director, Peter Hunt. Now, I've mentioned okay. him before, and I teased this a couple episodes back, that I thought that having him direct this movie was not the right choice. And I want to, you know, maybe it'll come up sort of more so as we're going through, but Peter Hunt was the editor of the first several James Bond movies. And I'm so divided on, this is me, this is coming at, at it from someone who does editing. I'm so divided on my opinion of Peter Hunt, because obviously... Those movies turned out terrifically. And the editor is often, you can watch many YouTube video essays on this, but the, the editor is oft forgotten in the creative triumvirate of movie making. If you look at screenwriting, directing, and editing, people often forget how much control and creative power an editor can have. Mm -hmm. And it's, I think, especially when you look at the commentary tracks and the other ancillary special features for something like From Russia With Love, it's inarguable that Peter Hunt was instrumental in saving that movie, which they had to sort of reconstruct a lot of in the edit. But at the same time, some of these techniques that he is not necessarily praised for, but credited with, some of these new and innovative techniques in editing are things like jump cuts in the middle of otherwise steady shots or very abrupt speed ramping. Mm -hmm. that I personally have found through the five movies we've watched so far found very distracting. Yeah. 
like just little things where it's like, oh, this action needs to happen more quickly. So we'll just play the film faster. And it it's, there are other ways to solve those problems. And, you know, he has this desire to sort of move the energy and the pace of his scene forward by more abrupt cutting. And sometimes it is successful and sometimes it isn't. One of the areas it is not successful is every fight scene in this movie. Every fight <laughs> scene in On Her Majesty's Secret Service is abysmal which is a shame because the rest of the movie is so good, but all the fight scenes are difficult to watch and frenetically edited. Oh, it's like cuts in the middle of punches to like people on the ground. Like they're huge cuts. They're the kinds of things that like, I don't know, you're probably better able to speak to this than I am. But if you're, you're editing a PG 13 movie and you like cut the impact the wrong way, the hits don't feel as hard and that kind of thing. And this is like, People begin to throw a punch and it cuts to like the punch has been thrown and the guy is on the ground already. It's really, really jarring and really difficult to parse. I found the same thing. Like it's yeah. super difficult to watch. It's not like like it almost feels like shaky cam, like the the sort of born movies where they're also really fin- frenetic and difficult to read and follow, except that it's not shaky cam. It's just edited like super jarringly. I'm glad you also mentioned the Bourne movies because I was thinking specifically of those when I was when I was watching some of these that the the fist fights in the Bourne movies and especially the car chase with Matt Damon and Carl Urban in the second movie are shot and edited in a way that you feel them more than you see them. And I remember that car chase specifically when it ended when the when the editing finally stopped after the impact at the end of that car chase, I saw this in theaters and the whole theater was just like, Oh, <laughs> you know, finally exhaling. It was this amazing. I understand why people don't like it to be clear. I totally get it. But the, the cinematography and the editing was making you feel the frenetic tension of the car mm-hmm. chase. Whereas this is jarring and upsetting to watch but Graham, you may you may be saying Peter Hunt directed this movie. He didn't edit it. That's correct. This was edited by John Glenn, not the space guy. Glenn with one N. John Glenn would edit future Bond movies, such as The Spy Who Loved Me and Moonraker, which did not feature this kind of editing. John Glenn also went on to direct Octopussy, A View to a Kill, The Living Daylights, and License to Kill. Oh. And John Glenn did second unit directing in this movie which is some of the action scenes john glenn also did second unit directing on the italian job the original or the remake the well (laughs) uh 1969 so the same year all right yeah so the the reason that i point towards peter hunt is because all of the unusual editing decisions in this movie manifest as a logical progression of his editing style through the previous movies that it's like now that he's in charge of the director's chair he can do what he wanted to do and the thing is some things that he wanted to do some big picture stuff you know making it's like okay we have a different james bond we're gonna make a different james bond movie i completely appreciate that desire you know especially for someone like peter hunt who'd been working on them for so long to finally get a chance as we t- talked about during you only live twice that he'd been wanting to direct for a while and they said no you're not going to do it and he basically left it was like fine i'm not doing the production at all and then they enticed him back to do second unit directing and then he saved that movie in the edit so they basically let him finally direct one having they felt he proved himself and so the desire to be like no this is going to be my own James Bond movie, I completely understand. But so many things about this movie in its style are so different from what we've seen so far that I think it's a big part of why audiences at the time felt very confused and sort of lost. And I don't even know that it's that it's the incorrect decision, but I think that for the first time that something like this was being attempted in this first ever blockbuster movie franchise to be replacing your lead actor. I think it might've been more beneficial to the franchise as a whole to shoot and produce this more akin to what audiences are familiar with simply changing James Bond 
than such an overall jarring tonal change to so many aspects of the movie that you may not even necessarily realize are changes. Right. That's interesting. I now I'm sorry. Now I'm noodling on your hypothesis. Mm. Yeah, no, please do. <laughs> so I like I'm thinking forward in the franchise. Casino Royale does this as well, right? Yeah. Like Casino Royale is not just a replacement of Bond, but it is like a full overhaul of the entire franchise into like adapting what is still relevant and basically throwing away everything that's not. Yeah, and it like obviously it works in Casino Royale. It it whereas it was not received as well here, and like some of it, I think is attributable to the, the specific things that they chose to change and the specific things that they <laughs> indulged on and that kind of thing. I just wonder if it's like, if they had, if you had just like, let's say we, we just swapped George Lazenby into you only live twice. Does yeah. that just throw the difference between him and Sean Connery into relief? Right. If they like, all you do is change the actor and do nothing else. Does that, actually make the difference between the more apparent or is it covered for by changing more of the film's style alongside and w whether or not it's a uh, like the right decision or not i just sort of I, like i'm mm -hmm. i wonder about that i would now i just want to see the the alternate universe where that happened right yeah like i don't know i think that's a really tough call and something that we can't ever really answer right and again i don't know if it would have been the right move but i i i wonder if audiences at the time would have been more receptive because this actually feels much more like a a modern movie than a movie made in 1969 and there are some changes you know like we're it's the cusp of a decade aspects of this certainly fashion wise feel a <laughs> lot more like we're moving forward and indeed that was a concern for a lot of people a big part of why george lazenby didn't come back is because i mean he to an extent and his agent to a much larger extent felt that James Bond's time was over. The character was a relic and didn't have a home in the 1970s. And obviously that would not be the case. But, you know, Lazenby, to his regret, says that he wished he'd done at least a second movie. Mm -hmm. And and I do too. I'm not even factoring in Diamonds Are Forever or you know, Connery coming back or future Bonds in it. I just wish we'd gotten to see a second George Lazenby outing and what yeah. that would have looked like, you know, because there are just so many, so many dials were tweaked. It's one of those things, right? It's when you're experimenting, you only change one variable at a time. Mm -hmm. Now you don't have the option to do that with something like a movie franchise where you're only making one every couple of years, but they tweaked so many dials in this movie that I, I'm not surprised that people were really sort of put on edge by it. Also, yeah. I mentioned the media hounding Sean Connery. Movie media, tabloid media in general, particularly in England, are ruthless and terrible. And long before the movie came out, we're already turning the court of public opinion against George Lazenby running stories about could he ever step into Sean Connery's shoes? There was a reporter on set in the commissary during an interview, and Diana Rigg joked with her co-star, with whom she got along very well, that they were going to have a scene that afternoon where they had to kiss. And she said, are you having garlic, George? I am. And then the tabloid press ran, you know, Diana Rigg eats garlic before love scenes with George Lazenby because they they don't like each other on set. You know, they positioned it as this vindictive thing that she was doing to a co-star that she hated and didn't get along with, which was not true. Right. You know, this was a joke among co-workers, but the press took that and ran with it and so even before the movie came out people were already soured on on the notion of george lazenby even the marketing department at united artists they interviewed on the dvd they interviewed someone who worked in the marketing department at united artists in the 60s talking about how much they regret how they handled it because all the previous movies were sean connery in this movie and then like sean connery is james bond and this one, they didn't mention the actor. It was just, hey, James Bond 007 is back. It's mm -hmm. James Bond. Whereas they should have helped their own guy. They should have supported their own actor and been like, George Lazenby, the new James Bond. Or, you know, actually like been a hype man for their own actor rather than try to hide right. the fact that 
he was different. So there's a there's so much going on with all of that. But the TLDR is that this movie is very good and George Lazenby is very good. And I can't wait to start talking about the movie. Yeah, cool. I I similarly agree. This movie is very good. And I think George Lazenby got a raw deal from public opinion. And mm-hmm. I think this movie got a raw deal from public opinion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had forgotten how much I honestly enjoyed many, many aspects of this movie. We can get into it in a sec. The the one thing I want to comment on just in terms of style of this movie is that just it's a thing that struck me is how long this movie takes to get to an action scene. Well, there's what there's a fist fight. There's a pretty extended fist fight in the pre title. Yes. Well, sorry, excluding the pre title, but. From from the beginning of the like core narrative of the film after the the opening sequence, there's there's that one fist fight, but then the, like it's solidly the first third of the movie has otherwise basically got no action. It's all set up. There's a like there's some fun stuff that happens, but it it I'm I was actually surprised by almost like relaxed <laughs> the opening portion of this movie feels. The screenplay by Richard Maybaum, I should have mentioned, sticks pretty closely to the book. This was a book that was being written during the production of some of the earlier movies. And Mm -hmm. as far as Peter Hunt was concerned, it was a it was a good book and they should just make the film of the book and not worry about changing too much. And so they didn't. All right. So let's talk about the movie. Yeah. The movie opens on a image of the universal export sign and we transition inside to M's office and M and Q are in his office having a conversation to the effect that they don't know where James Bond is. No one's been able to get a hold of him. He's out of contact and they're they're not sure where he is. M intercoms out to Moneypenny, who is also in her office, inquires with her about whether she's had any contact from Bond or if, if she knows where he is. She does not. And then the scene essentially cuts from... MI6, where nobody knows where Bond is, to a scenic highway where a man, his face obscured, is driving a car. I think that was very smart of them to start with a scene of familiar faces, to start with Bernard Lee and Lois Maxwell and Desmond Llewellyn of like, oh, it's it's M&Q and Moneypenny, just like always, before introducing a new James Bond. I think that was very clever. Yes, nestles you right into the security of knowing you're at home in a franchise full of full of people you know Mm -hmm. i i actually find it kind of interesting before we like go too much further in the opening sequence here that they like the first several shots of james bond have his face obscured so we we have a shot of him like driving in his car along this oceanside highway he pulls out a cigarette from his cigarette case puts it in his mouth and and lights it all framed in such a way that you just sort of see his chin and the, like his face is in, it like shrouded in darkness very very close shots similar to how sean connery was revealed in dr no yes yeah the one thing i find interesting is when they do actually reveal his face completely that shot is actually just like a totally nothing shot like they they don't deliver on it at all they're like building up this like oh it's a new bond oh it, you know it, it's who is it? And I like, obviously, likely most people would have known at this point he's on the poster, but they're, they're like playing up the mystery of the new Bond as if they're going to like have this grand reveal like they do in Dr. No. And then like he's just sort of in the back of shot getting out of a car. <laughs> yeah. And when he finally delivers Bond, James Bond, it's like a really obvious rear projection shot. <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, he's driving along the highway. As he's driving along, a car comes up behind him, lays on the horn, so he he sort of pulls over and gets out of the way. Can I remember the make and model off the top of my head? I probably cannot. What does the Internet Movie Cars database say? I'm literally desperately searching for this (laughs) right now. I am cdb.org. Seriously? Yeah. (laughs) Wow. How do we keep finding these? Why have we not found them before? I told you that I found the Internet Movie Firearms database the other day. Oh, good. (laughs) This is a 1969 Mercury Cougar that Diana Riggs' character is driving. So anyhow, it is a a Mercury Cougar, you're right. 
it guns it past him, you know, driving like a bat out of hell, and Bond continues to drive along, ultimately coming to a beach where he sees this red Mercury Cougar parked. The driver has gotten out, and he pulls up next to it and looks out at the beach and sees a woman walking into the waves. It's relatively apparent that the woman is is looking to kill herself. She's walking out to sea, ostensibly with the intent of ending her own life. So Bond guns it, drives down onto the beach, right out to where he runs out, like hops out of his car, runs down the remainder of the beach into the water up behind her, and grabs her shoulders. She says no, and then faints. And uh, he picks her up and and carries her back to shore. It's never made exactly clear why she's trying to kill herself, I should add. That's true. It's not. As the first introduction of the character, her character sort of builds from this incident, but it doesn't really get explained at all. Yeah. We know she's being pursued. Mm -hmm. No sooner has Bond brought her back up to the beach than they are accosted by two goons, one of whom has a gun, one of whom ultimately pulls a knife. The, the goons are here to collect this woman. They, they sort of separate her and Bond. One of them starts walking her away, and the other, pointing a gun at Bond, walks him over to a boat, asks him to, to get in and lie down. And as he goes to shoot him, Bond manages to throw this giant, like, grappling hook thing at him, knocking the gun from his hand and uh, leading to a fight on the beach where, where they both lay into each other for a while. Ultimately, he wins and goes over and, and accosts the other goon that is that is walking the woman away. While he is fighting with this other goon, she runs over the beach to where Bond's car is parked, hops in Bond's car, drives it back up to the parking ridge at the top of the beach, hops out, hops in her car, and drives away. Bond manages to subdue the second goon, discovers that his car has been stolen, and that she's used it to escape, and uh, in a fourth wall breaking moment, remarks to the camera, well, this never happened to the other fellow. He actually says that not to the camera, but does then after glance to the camera just as it cuts to the opening titles. And it is it is weird. I actually don't I don't know how I feel about it. Like, it's cute. You know, like, it's it's fun that it's like, oh, you know, let's actually, you know, lampshade this thing. But I feel like, I don't know, maybe, you know, your mileage may vary on winking to the camera in this regard yeah i like it i like it too i don't know if it's to the benefit of the movie <laughs> yeah 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 i i i feel that like i don't know it, it feels like a cute wink and, and you already said it was cute like I, mm -hmm. I i agree with that i like it i think it's charming you're right that it may not be to the overall benefit of the movie when i saw this the first time when i was quite young granted i had no idea what was going on in this scene <laughs> <laughs> right if you aren't aware none of, of this whole... red like none of yeah. the scan for me at all right and i just want to reiterate how impossible to follow and badly edited and disorienting <laughs> this fist fight is it's so bad i think your mileage may vary on this entire scene we should say it is diana riggs character in this scene it is not just yeah like a random woman if you haven't watched the movie before you don't necessarily i mean unless you know who the stars are i guess but if you're watching you no this movie, frame totally of reference fine. for who this you have is no frame of reference for who this is all you know is that it it is a woman who is walking herself out to sea ostensibly to evade capture by a couple of goons and she's not too keen on being rescued by bond so that's that's our opening sequence then we move on to the opening titles and the opening title track is not a song it is instrumental and the opening title visuals are very classic maurice binder bright colors and silhouettes of women and james bond laid in with footage from the five previous bond movies to really further hammer home no no this is the same guy no shots of sean connery but all of the co-stars and villains that we've come to know over the course of the five previous movies. I have such opposite thoughts about the opening <laughs> title track and the opening titles themselves, because despite not being a song, I adore the theme song to On Her Majesty's Secret Service. I oh, love it, it so much. It's so, <laughs> so good. And the titles themselves are 
garbage. <laughs> I'm a little softer on the titles, but I am totally with you at the song. It, absolute banger alert. I highly recommend the, it's not even a remix. It's just a cover. The cover of this theme music by the Propeller Heads from their album Dex and Drums and Rock and Roll. It's like eight minutes mm-hmm. long and it's so good. But yeah, it's, I love the soundtrack to this movie and the main title track of on her majesty's secret service and i just the opening titles they just to me they just don't do anything interesting it's like look at things you might remember and a bunch of pretty uninspired silhouettes that are off center why are they off center anyway (laughs) so i like i like the like trip down memory lane so to speak particularly when you consider that in the last year when a bond movie released a like knockoff bond movie also released so they're up against like a competing bond movie at this i mean it's been two years but they're up against a competing bond movie and a new character in the role i i feel like cementing the like no these are the bond movies feels appropriate i hadn't considered the aspect of you know, the original and best, please observe the true James Bond lineage. And that's <laughs> except no substitutions. <laughs> yeah, that is that is that is fair. I don't know. I felt like it was a little ham handed of just like, look at all the previous things. This guy is also Bond. Ha ha. Yeah. And that's totally fair. But there's another two hours of movie to talk about. So let's 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 not tarry on the opening titles. Sure. The movie starts. And at this point, Bond checks into a hotel. He pulls up, I, I believe it's the Plaza Hotel. It's a, it's very fancy, whatever it is. It's a very fancy hotel. He remarks on the fact that it is up to its usual standards. The concierge brings him up to his room, shows him around. While being shown around, he inquires about the red car out front, noting that it is the same red car that was driven by the, the woman that he rescued from the beach earlier on. The concierge lets him know that the car belongs to one Contessa Teresa de Vicenzo. And and basically that that is sort of the end of the scene. Bond will, that evening, go down to the casino in the... Oh, sorry, no, there's an incredible transition. I love the transition. I'm glad you mentioned it because I was going to bring it up as well. It is a fantastic little piece of cinematography. The scene basically ends with, like, this room will do. This is this will satisfy my needs. The view is nice. And it it gives a, a look out the window to the swimming pool in the courtyard of the hotel. Beautiful turquoise, like people swimming and, and doing their thing. And and it just transitions to the same shot exactly locked off at night, but with the word casino in bright red letters reflected off the water of the pool. Because it's the enormous sign on the side of the building. Yeah, it's yeah. such a good transition. I I like that one a lot. It it is a little reminiscent of like the neon signs transition in You Only Live Twice. Like it's not it's it's not the same, but it it like similar kind of like bright like bright colors on a like black background feel sort of evokes it for me. This movie as a whole definitely does a little more experimental, interesting stuff with cinematography. The cinematographer was Michael Reed, who had done some second unit stuff on earlier Bond films and had worked with Peter Hunt in Hunt's role as a producer on Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, (laughs) which Richard Maybaum also wrote. I mentioned that that actress from the Casino Royale parody movie was in Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, largely just as an amusing reference, but turns out there's more connection to the Bond franchise than I thought. So uh, just on the topic of weird interconnections, there is also a character in this movie who was a character in Casino Royale, who we haven't gotten to yet, but there's yet more actor sharing between this film and Casino Royale. I'm now absolutely baffled at who that could be, so I can't wait to find out. <laughs> we'll get there. Okay. So anyhow, after this transition, we we head down to the casino where, where Bond walks up to the Baccarat table and begins playing Baccarat, basically. We, we have some, some cards being played, and after a little while, Teresa appears. We're, we don't know it's her, but Bond, you can tell Bond has a pretty good sense that it's her. She observes the game of Baccarat for a few minutes and then places a bet and she loses. Loses badly. Loses badly. Loses to the tune of what? Like, I don't remember what the 
monetary unit is, but it's 20,000 of whatever the 20, monetary unit is. 20,000 yeah. <laughs> so she makes the bet, she loses. She then is conversing with the, the pit boss of the casino, and she says she, you know, she tells him she doesn't have the money. The gentleman she's speaking to is like, well, we can't front you the credit. And the, they go back and forth for a few moments with Bond watching on. And uh, one of the others at the table remarks to him, it's like, oh, she's she's made a bet she can't back. After watching this go on for a few moments, Bond saves the day again by commenting that uh, it's like, oh, the lady forgot our arrangement. We're partners this evening. So, you know, here, I'll, I'll pay. And, and he just tosses the chips across the table thereby releasing her from her debt and diffusing the situation. So he ends up following her like he he cashes out his chips as she turns to walk away. He he follows her into the restaurant. They they sit down at a table. She chides him a little bit for saving her yet again and uh, Bond orders a bottle of Dom Perignon 57 like he does. She basically is not, you know, she's not super appreciative she she like has now sort of got a bit of a grudge against him for bailing her out over and over again without her having asked for it. Mm-hmm. But she invites him up to her room anyhow. Bond is like, all right, cool. And the, the waiter comes back with the bottle of champagne on ice. And he's like, OK, send it up to room 423. So Bond then heads up to room 423 knocks and lets himself in notices that his his bottle of champagne along with some caviar that he's ordered have have arrived and it's like all right i'm in the right place walks in and is ambushed by a goon yep a fight ensues as they throw each other around the room and break virtually every piece of furniture on the set bond ultimately emerges victorious this is another instance of a a a goon that is basically impervious to pain and that that kicks Bond's ass up one side and down the other. And and Bond just sort of manages to to get the upper hand by essentially outlasting him and taking a beating. Does finally emerge victorious, subdues the goon and heads for the door on his way out, grabs a cracker, smears some caviar on it, knocks it back on his way out, like down the hall comments what is it royal beluga from the north of the caspian and then rounds the corner at the end of the hall yeah <laughs> it's like we- weird flex but okay <laughs> yeah just identifies the specific origin of the caviar from its taste on his way away from a fight to no one in particular you just imagine him around that corner being like still got it <laughs> <laughs> high-fiving himself on the way down yeah. the hall yeah, yeah, once the cameras are off him. He gets to his own room and, you know, starts to, like, he takes off his holster and what have you. He finds Tracy there, or Teresa. She has now, at this point, let him know that she prefers to go by Tracy. So he finds Tracy there, waiting for him. Tracy then threatens to kill him. Bond manages to get the gun away from her and uh, starts asking her why, why there was a goon in her room. She tells him that she has no idea she she's not involved bond doesn't believe her and slaps her but she is like no really i truthfully i have no idea who the goon is so bond then sort of like wonders at like well like clearly you're in trouble you that we were chased by goons earlier there's a goon searching through your room what like what's your deal tracy doesn't give him anything she doesn't she doesn't like reveal uh anything she knows but she does she does basically seduce him in payment. Like she, she sort of makes that quite explicit in payment for the casino rescue. She, she sort of uh, tells him, "It's like consider me a woman you've bought for the evening." Bond, Bond, sort of is like, "Well, who needs to pay?" And and they have a little bit of banter back and forth. Ultimately, they, you know, they start making out, and and we assume they sleep together. I have to give just huge props to diana rig for the delivery of a vocal utterance at the end of this scene because after bond has important point put his ppk in the drawer of the bedside table and then we see a shot of the goon who was fighting him just moments ago listening at their door and then walking away they get into bed and they have that banter that you were talking about and she's like look, I don't like being indebted to anybody, so I'm paying you back in full. And he sort of is like, 
Okay. 20,000 is a lot of money. And she looks at him and just goes, "Mm -hmm." (laughs) Mm-hmm. With this mixture of... It's it's impossible to describe. It's such an amazing read. She's she's keeping eye contact with him. And this little "Mm hmm that she makes is a combination of like, like, yes, it is. You're going to get 20,000 worth of me tonight. (laughs) I'm kind of into it, but I don't like that you are coming out ahead in this transaction. Like that it is, there's a lot said in this lack of word from Mm -hmm. Diana Rigg at the end of the scene. I was just like, gosh, she's so good. It's hard really to describe, is. like I said, but it's 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 a very good moment. To this film's credit and to Diana Riggs' credit, Tracy is great. Like Tracy is is as a character is rad. And the layers in this delivery are are like sowing the seeds of that. But like uh, like Tracy's great. <laughs> mm-hmm. When Bond wakes up, he goes back to where he left his gun and finds instead 20,000 worth of chips from the Baccarat table. And he sort of comments to himself, hmm, paid in full. Interesting. So she's taken his gun and left him the 20,000. So I don't know. I guess she enjoyed herself. That part's unclear. <laughs> he gets dressed in a like lapelless jacket. It's very, very late 60s. It's a, it's kind of a cool look. Weird maybe for James Bond, but I, I kind of dig this like suit and turtleneck look he's got going on. Anyway, he tries to leave the hotel and then he is very politely abducted by two men with a gun who are just sort of do like a, you're going to, you're going to come with us. And they lead him out to a car in the car is the man that he fought in the room last night. And he just sort of affably goes along with it. He sits down and the man pulls a knife on him in the car. And then they go for a very, very long drive a very long drive it's nighttime when they eventually arrive at their destination so there's three of them one of whom with a knife one of whom with a gun leading him to the back room of some sort of office in a warehouse there's a janitor whistling the goldfinger theme song (laughs) which is cute (laughs) which is just sort of cute they, I should say, overall, in terms of cinematography, a lot more camera movement. And I don't mean like shaky or anything, and I don't mean disorienting. There's disorienting stuff later, but I don't mean that the movement is disorienting. Just a lot more tracking shots side to side, like a lot more sort of general dolly movement of the camera. It, it's mm-hmm. honestly very good. There's There's one in particular that stands out to me from later in the film. I don't remember exactly where. I just remember that it happens where they're, they're like sitting around a table and the camera like pulls out from the table. And they're like, there's, it's quite a noticeable camera move, but it, it like adds to the scene immensely. Mm. I like that one a lot. Yeah. They get to a door. It's clearly the door that they want to have Bond go through. And so he, having lulled them into a false sense of security by being affable and going along with it the whole time, he fights them. He attacks them and manages to fist fight all three of them successfully grabs a knife from the guy who had a knife dives through the door they were delivering him to locks it behind him holds up the knife like a throwing knife and waits to take stock of what is awaiting him on the far side and what is awaiting him is an absolutely opulent living room with a man in a suit with a red carnation in his lapel sitting behind the table who is in the middle of talking to someone who's presumably his secretary who basically says oh hello nice to nice to see you i was i was waiting for you and you know he says something akin to don't kill me now let me explain myself and if you don't like what i have to say i'll give you another opportunity to kill me afterwards yes that's basically what he says and then one of my favorite pieces of cinematography in the whole movie Bond hurls the knife at a wooden calendar thing that's behind this man. And the shot is this man in focus and the calendar thing out of focus behind him. He turns around, looks at it. The camera remains focused on him. He turns back around to Bond. Then he looks back to the calendar, puts his glasses up to his face. Then the camera focuses on the calendar then he yeah. takes his glasses down and the camera's focus returns back to him. It's just a beautiful detail of like 
can't see what happened, glasses so that we can focus. Oh, I see now. Glasses come down. It's out of focus again. It's it's such a little touch, and I love it so much. And it's followed by a great character moment as well, <laughs> because their exchange after he does it is so, so good. He looks at the, the calendar, then looks back at the calendar, realizes that the knife is like in a day, right? Mm-hmm. And the knife is in September 14th. And he says, he's like, Mr. Bond, today is the 13th. And Bond just responds, I'm superstitious. Yeah. <laughs> It's great. <laughs> and it's it's one of those things that like it's the perfect amount of Bond being still affable and suave, mm-hmm. but also like, is he so good that he intentionally hit the 14 because he's superstitious? Or did he miss the 13 by an inch and is just playing it off as intentional? The the delivery of everybody in the scene is such that it leaves that totally ambiguous, but just feels great. <laughs> Yeah. So this man introduces himself. This is Marc-Ange Draco, or Draco, played by Gabriel Verzetti, who is the head of Union Corse, a major crime syndicate in Europe. He introduces himself as Europe's largest crime syndicate, and Bond corrects him by saying, well, that's not true because Spectre operates worldwide. Yeah. <laughs> This scene goes on for some time, but the, the the TLDR is he is Tracy's father, and he's aware that they have crossed paths once or twice. They're sort of medium estranged in that they only see each other really sort of once a year for his birthday, and she doesn't listen to anything that he says, and is you know she's a wild free spirit who, in his estimation, needs the right kind of man to bring her down to earth. And he thinks James Bond could be that kind of man. And even more so, if James Bond will do this for him, he'll give Bond a million dollars if it all works out and they get married. And Bond's like, I don't, that's not really how I play. You know, without <laughs> you know, without saying it in such a crass way, he basically says, I'm having too much fun being a bachelor and I'm not interested in getting married, but thank you for your time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like he he all he does almost make it like do it, say it that crassly because he, he says he's like quite fond of the bachelor's life mm-hmm. is one of the excuses he gives. Also, like the general regard that both of the men in this scene have for Tracy is not great. <laughs> No, (laughs) because her father is like she needs a man to dominate her and make her subdued, essentially, because she's so wild. And and Bond is like she needs a psychiatrist, not a husband. Mm. Both of them are terrible in this scene. This whole scene is like two men talking about a woman who isn't there as if she has no agency. They're like they're very, very sort of paternalistic, which isn't even just like a generally bad thing, but it's also like sort of counter to everything that we've seen and will see of Tracy, the character. Yeah, I mean, it is clear that this is an opinion of Tracy, who is just by and large, just a well-realized person that just doesn't conform to their expectations of her. Yeah, Tracy is not crazy. She's not even that wild. She's just, you know her own person doing her own thing so there there is one more thing one more piece of information is exchanged before the scene ends bond does tell her father that he doesn't want his money because he's not interested in getting married and doesn't want to be obliged to it but what he does want is the whereabouts of blofeld the head of specter who he's yeah. sure that draco can give him that information so he's like all right i'll go like i don't want your money but i'll go along with this I'll agree to continue seeing Tracy if you reveal the whereabouts of Blofeld. Yeah. So then we head back to MI6. The standard Bond returns to MI6, throws his hat to the the hat rack in Moneypenny's office. There's a little bit of banter between them. Moneypenny tells Bond that M needs to see him right away. And so sends him into M's office, at which point M responds that he's being removed from Operation Bedlam. Operation Bedlam is their mission to find and do away with Blofeld. Yeah. He's told he's been on the case now for two years. He has not been successful to this point. The relevancy of the operation is becoming lower anyhow. Like they not even as concerned about finding Blofeld because they basically think he's in the wind. Bond protests. He's like, no, this is something of a must for me. I, I don't want to put my skills 
to anything else. And M is like, he sort of un- like undermines his skills. Like, I'm sure we can find something better suited to your skills after having just talked him down for being unable to complete the mission. Yeah. And so there's a, there's actually like a bit of tension between them in this scene. Mm-hmm. And he's like, nope, it's done. You're removed. We'll find you a new assignment. You're dismissed. Bond heads back to Money Penny, Penny's office, asks Money Penny to take a letter, and proceeds to, to dictate his resignation. He heads back to his desk and starts to clear out all his keepsakes, and we get a little rundown of all the various gadgets from the previous movies as we see the rebreather and the the watch with the little garrot in it. I don't know why he held on to Honey Rider's belt and shellfish collecting knife. How did he even get Honey Rider's belt and shellfish collecting knife? Right? She survived that movie. Yeah. <laughs> It, I, I don't understand. We don't talk about it. Honey Rider's belt and shellfish collecting knife, the watch with the garrot from From Russia With Love, and the rebreather from Thunderball. And then he sits down and has a drink, and there's a shot of him reflected in a portrait of the queen, and he toasts to the queen, basically being like, well, sorry, mom. So immediately thereafter, he's recalled to M's office goes in m is sitting at his desk scribbling away at a piece of paper and without even really looking up hands him back his letter and just says request granted and like really dryly too and it's like it's like holy crap yeah (laughs) that's 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 harsh wow all right bond then stands there bond's a little shaken by that shocked yeah like he was so sure of himself that this was gonna change m's mind he like has to take a moment to collect himself, walks out into Money Penny's office with like a look back from the door, basically waiting for M to be like, no, I'm kidding. Walks into the office and and basically starts licking his wounds at Money Penny's desk, being like, wow, he just granted it. He just let me resign. Yeah, I wasn't prepared for this. Money Penny then reveals to him that in fact he should read the letter, and he does, and finds that. Money Penny has in fact not presented his resignation to M, but has in fact presented to M a request for two weeks leave. Because Money Penny is great. Because Money Penny's great. So Bond is like, oh, what would I do without you? And she's like, well, you didn't really want to resign, did you? And he's like, no, of course not. And so he heads out. And then as soon as Bond has left the office, we get a, an intercom from M to Money Penny going, Money Penny, what would I do without you? <laughs> <laughs> i love that they both played him yeah yeah it's great the this this whole scene is great the character dynamics are right on key mm-hmm. i love it it's a great little bit we then get back to portugal and draco's family villa i suppose because it's his birthday tracy is driving back in her super awesome looking car and all the locals are happy to see her because of course she only ever comes back for his birthday so everyone's waving hi to her as she drives up and she notices as soon as she parks that parked in the space beside where she's parking is an Aston Martin DB Vantage, <laughs> <laughs> which not only audiences at home, but she also recognizes as James Bond's car. Yeah. And so this scene is Draco, as he acts for the first time, introducing Tracy and Bond. He's like, oh, there's someone I absolutely must, you know, have you meet and whatever. God, again, Tracy's so good in this scene because the the TLDR of this scene is she immediately susses out that something is up, talks with some other family member, potentially a younger sister. It's a little unclear actually who this is. Yeah, but functionally a younger sister. Yeah, gets the gets the lowdown on what's going on and is hurt that Bond is only showing interest in her for the information that her dad could provide and basically says to her dad, look, whatever it is that he wants to know, I want you to tell him, completely irrespective of what he and I might do, tell him the information that he wants right now because I'm your daughter and I'm asking you. And if you don't tell him, you will never see me again. And so he agrees to, and she goes, great. So then that's taken care of, goodbye, and leaves. And Bond chases after her, catching up with her at her car as she is facing away from camera. And Bond basically is like, hey, I I didn't just want the information. I, you know, I... I did actually want to see you again. And she turns around with tears in her eyes because she actually does have feelings for Bond and thought that he was only interested in this information. And so 
him following after her sort of like no let's actually hey like cool i've got the information i don't have to hang out with you but i still want to can we do that and so then we get a montage of it's like from a romantic movie actually it's like a montage (laughs) of them falling in love yeah they go for a horse ride they go for a horse ride there's the lewis armstrong recording of we have all the time in the world which is the i guess the the lyrics song for this movie yeah that'll be the lyrical song for this film this was also the last thing that lewis armstrong ever recorded really yeah before his before his death this was the last thing he ever recorded huh and so yeah it's a very like atypical scene for a bond film of you know a montage of people falling in love and it goes on quite a while too like it does it's basically the entire duration of the song scenes of them like walking in a garden and shopping in a town the kind of like romantic montage scenes that you see in romantic montage movies Mm -hmm. (laughs) let's put all that nonsense behind us the information that bond gets is that one of draco's men recently defected to blofeld and he did so via a connection with gebruder gumbolt which is a law firm in switzerland so uh, after spending the time with Tracy and, and their relationship starting to, to develop, Bond stages an operation. They go to Bern, Switzerland as a family. The, the scene that leads into this operation is amazing. Yeah, it's Draco sitting in the middle back seat of his car <laughs> with the other two sitting on either side of him, just staring through him like doe-eyed lovebird idiots. <laughs> It's so good. He looks so awkward in the middle. It's really funny. Anyhow, they basically, they drop him off at this law firm. And as he is going up the elevator, the lawyer who runs the office is in the process of locking the door and heading out for lunch. And they pass each other in the hallway. Bond walks up to the door of the office and pulls out a key from nowhere and opens the door and lets himself in. He makes his way to the the primary, like the desk of, of Gumbolt and finds a safe and then walks over to the window. And the balcony on this office is overlooking a construction site that has a large crane. And uh, there's a compatriot of Bond basically standing next to a dump truck looking like you know, one of the workers, the crane takes its bucket and uh, sets it down next to the compatriot who puts a case into the bucket and the bucket is hoisted up to the, the balcony and Bond grabs the case, opens the case, and inside is a combination safe cracker slash photocopy machine. And so Bond sets the safe cracking mechanism to, to go, takes off his watch and sets it down so that he can keep track of the time and leans back to let it do, it, let it do its thing grabs a Playboy magazine out of the magazine basket beside his chair and sits down and inspects the centerfold. Eventually, the machine cracks the safe. He opens the safe inside a bunch of papers. He goes through them all, finds some correspondence, and photocopies it. And we don't, at this point, learn what the content of the correspondence that he's photocopying is. As he is doing this, we see Gumbolt coming back to the office and his compatriot down in the the construction site getting anxious about the fact that like why is this taking so long it shouldn't be taking this long when is he going to be ready for me to take the thing bond finishes closes up the case walks over to the balcony the can gets hoisted up (laughs) he fully just like throws the case into the bucket turns around leaves locks up once again passes gumbolt in the hallway on the way back to the elevator Having stolen the centerfold from the Playboy. Having stolen the centerfold from the Playboy magazine. And from there, I believe we cut back to MI6. Yes, where James is basically going, so that mission you took me off of, I definitely didn't actually stop being on that mission. Also, (laughs) I found out this information. And he's filling in M on a bunch of stuff that he's actually done between these scenes. Because he found out information on someone named Beauchamp. In in fact, sorry, it's not even M's office at MI6. It's M's home. Oh, that's right. He goes to M's home. Where M has an impressive collection of mounted butterflies, like a a, a wall just covered in them. And uh, Bond makes some sort of reference about like, oh, that's an unusual size for a Gibbs scientific name of butterfly. And M is like, well, I didn't know you were into lepidoptery. I didn't realize that lepidoptery was among your areas of expertise, I think, is is specifically the line. (laughs) Yeah, but in this incredibly like dry, not actually impressed way that Bernard Lee was really excellent at doing. (laughs) 
And so he fills them in that he found out information in the safe about a Mr. Beauchamp or someone at least trying to be recognized as the heir to the lineage of being Count Beauchamp and this person being Blofeld. And indeed that this person had been in communication with the British College of Arms to doing a complete sort of lineage audit to prove that Blofeld is indeed the heir to Count Beauchamp and can enjoy all rights and titles that are associated with holding that name. So Bond has taken the liberty of working with the college with the assurance that what he's asking them to do is for the benefit of queen and country and arranged that he will be going to visit Blofeld to confirm this under the auspices of being someone from the British College of Arms. So he goes to the college and meets with Professor Hilary Bray, who's the man who he's talking to, under the cover story of doing some research on his own family crest. By the way, the James Bond family motto translates to the world is not enough, which itself would be the name of a Bond film later. I The one thing that I want to check back on at some point in the future because I'm sure they did, is in Skyfall, I want to know if the Bond family coat of arms shows up oh, anywhere. If it, if it matches? On, on Skyfall, and if it is the same one. I'm sure mm. if they did, it does, and I'd be surprised if they didn't include it. So now it's just something for me to think about when we get to Skyfall. I love that it's so simple, too. It's the, the phrase is just Orbis non-sufficient. Orbis non-sufficient. I mean, I, I don't I'm I not get doing it. The, I'm not doing the Latin pronunciation correctly, yeah. but yes, Orbis non-sufficient. <laughs> the world is not enough. Yeah. Dr. Hilary Bray, played by George Baker, who was a very sort of that guy from British film and TV. He's been on Doctor Who or Coronation Street he played number two in one of the episodes of The Prisoner. He actually played a parody James Bond character in the farcical sitcom of Up Pompeii. He played, the, <laughs> which was uh, the character of J Jameis Bondus. And as as well as playing Dr. Hilary Bray in this movie, also dubbed James Bond's voice when George Lazenby is impersonating Dr. Hilary Bray. Because originally... George Lazenby was doing an impersonation, but it like wasn't as good as it could have been. And so they were like, wait, we'll just get George Baker to dub the voice. in." <laughs> so then we get to George Lazenby as James Bond, as Dr. Hilary Bray arriving in Switzerland. Yes, he is met by. So I assume that the Olympics were held in Switzerland in what I'm going to guess was 1968. See, I thought that too. And I'm looking it up right now. And the last time they were in Switzerland was the Winter Olympics, because we assume the Winter Olympics, because this is a ski resort, was 1948. Yeah. And you mentioned that because the hired goon who meets him with the Spectre agent, well, we don't know that that's who she is, but it, we can assume if she's working you for can, Blofeld. She's clearly a Spectre agent. <laughs> who meets him at the train station is wearing an Olympic uniform it, it, it's the the jacket he's wearing has the olympic rings on it yeah and he's not the only one like there are several people in this town yeah wearing olympic outfit because like this jacket is common right like it's it's an orange jacket with like black highlighting or trimming an olympic logo on it and multiple people are wearing them and yeah. it's never really addressed by the film at all but yes this goon happens to be wearing one but Apparently, the Olympics were not in Switzerland around this time. So the only thing I can think is that maybe the town that they are ostensibly in is is like where like it, it's in the Alps somewhere. Mm -hmm. And presumably the town they're in has perhaps the Swiss Winter Olympic team, a training ground or something like that. Well, yeah, because there's a bobsled track here and there's downhill slopes. There's like there's obviously there's obviously Olympic infrastructure or at least high level Alpine event competitive infrastructure here yeah prior in 1968 they were in grenoble france and then in 72 they'd be in sapporo japan so the character of grunther is played by a russian so maybe 
He's meant to look like someone from the Russian team. I don't know what the 1968 Russian Olympic team uniforms looked like. I didn't go that deep on the research. <laughs> I will say that the actor, Yuri Boryenko, was a Russian wrestler who did a screen test with George Lazenby because they were like, okay, well, you look cool and we think you can act okay, but you've done a screen test where you're doing an acting thing. We need to do a screen test where you're doing action. So the stunt arranger, George Leach, set up a fight between George Lazenby and Yuri Boryenko to sort of see how he is on camera. And George Lazenby, with his zero experience, doesn't know how to do a stage punch and just punched him in the nose. <laughs> and he started bleeding very heavily from the nose. <laughs> and so they were like, well, boy, that looked great. Lazenby, you've got the job. Yuri, you also get a role. <laughs> So that's why that's why Yuri Boryanko is playing the role of Grunther because Lazenby, you know, didn't break his nose, but did some damage to his nose during during the screen test. <laughs> so Bond as Bray arrives in the Alps. He is collected by two hench persons. We have Irma Bunt, Blofeld's right hand, and uh, then of course our goon. I do want to mention that Irma Bunt is played by Ilsa Stepat who had a long acting career, and they had intended to bring her character back in Diamonds Are Forever. Unfortunately, the actress passed away between films, and so they ended up not doing that, obviously. So this is her last film role. But her first film role was in 1947, so she had a long film career. Wow. Before we dive into, actually, the rest of the scene, it's worth calling this out. This is where the movies basically throw out the idea of hard continuity. There hadn't really been continuity up to this point either, but this is definitely the first instance where it's like, okay, just to be clear, there is zero continuity. Because there was always sort of like occasional, it's like we, we're aware of Spectre. Bond knows who Blofeld is, but like there's never continuity really between Bond films you know, like at the end of the film, he and his co-star are very much in love. And then she's never heard from again or mentioned right. or seen. And so each film, even in the first five, has sort of existed in this nebulous space where there's like broad franchise continuity, but nothing specific from movie to movie. And yeah, where you're going with this is that he and Blofeld act like they've never met. <laughs> Yes, and they, they have to. So I would say that the first five Bond movies operate in a world where there is loose continuity. We can we can say that those five those five movies happen roughly in chronological order with one another, and the knowledge that Bond has of Spectre in You Only Live Twice was accumulated across his previous adventures involving Spectre in the previous three of four movies. I think loose continuity does it pretty accurately. Obviously yeah. later on, certainly in Casino Royale and Quantum of Solace, we would and in and indeed in some of the later Daniel Craig ones as well they would get even more rigid continuity, which, I mean, we'll talk about it, but I think is kind of a mistake. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you agree. But yeah, this is the one where they're very clearly like, look, we just have to pretend like they don't know one another. Just go with it. <laughs> Each one of these Bond movies is the same idea of Bond in an adventure, but each Bond movie is isolated from every other Bond movie, or at least this Bond movie is isolated from the previous Bond movies, and the like. The knowledge of Blofeld doesn't carry forward. Also, at the train station is the we assume British agent who helped Bond out in Switzerland at the construction site, who's conspicuously keeping an eye on them from behind a newspaper. The character has a name, which is Sean Campbell even though we never find out his name. And in fact, they never speak. <laughs> yeah. Bond and this character are never actually like in the same area. Like they're, they're in scenes together, but never like beside one another. They never speak or communicate. Yeah, they're, they're clearly in cahoots and that's, that's it. Okay, so Bond gets collected. Irma Boont asks him, you know, oh, how was your trip? Bond as Bray. He, he passes the like the stuffy academic off really well mm -hmm. probably not in small part attributable to the fact that he's being dubbed the the response of like oh quite intolerable i'm afraid i don't i'm not i don't travel well 
putting off this this air of having been really put out by having traveled here. So they load him into a horse-drawn carriage. They pile him up with a like a fur blanket and head off. This is where his compatriot sort of peers over the newspaper at him, and he hops in a car and follows them. The horse-drawn carriage takes us through this little town up to a helipad, and Boont then says, all right, now upon arrival at the helipad, it's like, all right, we're halfway there. The rest of the trip we take by air, and they all pile into this helicopter. The helicopter flies them to the top of the Alps to an installation on the peak of the mountain, well above the ski area below, called Pease Gloria. Now... I'm sure you have I'm sure you have trivia here. This is the reason that it took them so long to film this movie because they've been wanting to make on Her Majesty's Secret Service for many years, but finding the appropriate location was a real challenge. I mean, obviously, look at it. It's amazing. <laughs> where where is that going to be if you don't just go and build it yourself? They didn't have to build it themselves entirely. <laughs> But they did have to build a lot of it themselves. So on top of Mount Schilthorn, or I guess just the Schilthorn, was a partially completed restaurant. And the owner was like, okay, you can film here, but you have to help me finish it. (laughs) (laughs) So he's like, all the interiors, because the interiors are on location. He's like, the interiors... You're not just going to build me sets. You're building actual interiors. Like, I want you to build the place the way you want it for the movie, but they have to hold up. You're not just building these out of plywood. Right. And they have to function as a restaurant when I'm done. Exactly. Also, you got to build a helicopter pad. (laughs) So they had to take 500 tons of concrete by helicopter up this mountain. Did they also build the cable car? I I guess the cable car was already there. But they built the okay. helicopter oh, pad. Because they, they would have probably built that in the process of building out the, the outer structure of this building, which was partially completed at the time. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Because I'm like, the cable car would cost as much as the movie. It cost $125,000 just to build the helipad because of all the concrete that it took. But at the end of it, the restaurant, which is called Please Gloria, was the first ever revolving restaurant i love that they get mileage out of the revolving floor in the movie it's really entertaining actually yes (laughs) that's the giveaway that it's a restaurant too they do a really good job of making this like they built it so of course they did they like did a really good job of making the interiors look like a mountaintop installation for the purposes of which we are about to embark but The fact that when it's dinner time, the tables rotate into the back of the living room is like, okay. (laughs) Yeah. Using the location, not that they didn't use sets in this movie, but using the location is a big part of the visual tonal shift that I sort of talked about at the beginning of this episode. When you look at, it's most notable because we have a direct comparison point. When you look at the scenes in M's office, when you look at the scenes in M's office in the previous Connery movies, the lighting is soundstage lighting. It's very, if you know what you're looking for, it's very obviously there are banks of lights above this set that has no ceiling. Whereas in this movie, the sets all had ceilings. And if you look at a side by side of M's office in a Connery movie and M's office in this movie, it's much more naturalistic lighting. It's lighting from the windows or from the light fixtures where they would actually be. It's lighting that would naturally happen in a room like that. And that's that's true, not just of that, but of the whole movie that they're trying for a much more natural appearance to the lighting and the cinematography and less obvious artifice, which is just sort of like a yet further big obvious difference in Mm. how the movie is presented even if you don't necessarily notice that i realize that i'm particularly bad for this myself (laughs) but i'm just like (laughs) hey wait that's different i thought it was really interesting just how different m's office looks when it's being lit in a way that makes it look natural right so bond as bray rides the helicopter up to the top of the mountain Boont asks him, are you experiencing the air sickness? To which he he sort of nods 
yeah. He arrives, they walk him in. Boont immediately insists that he be taken to the infirmary so that their doctor can can look him over. Uh, and he's like, no, no, I'm, I'm back on the ground now. I'm fine. And she's like, no, no, I insist. We must make sure you are perfectly well. You have much work to do here. We we don't want to risk anything. So she's, she's like, all right, fine. Sort of whisks him off to the infirmary and then subsequently a tour of the building and then turn, turns to the henchman who is carrying his luggage and says, you have 10 minutes, then return it to his room. Because presumably they are going to search. Yes. Yeah. Now, what is this place actually? Because in, I mean, sorry, in real life, it's a restaurant. In the movie, it's Blofeld's weird mountaintop headquarter, and we'll find out what his plan is later. But what is the public story in the movie of what Count Beauchamp, not Blofeld, is doing up on top of a mountain? According to the cover story... This is the Blochamp Institute of Allergy Research. It is a not-for-profit, like, privately funded research institute, the purpose of which is to cure people of their various food allergies or other allergies, ostensibly, but it is depicted in the film. It's all, it's all food. I think that will tie into the actual story later on, although it's only ever sort of alluded to. The residents of this institution are 12 beautiful young women from around the world, all of whom have some sort of allergy and all of whom are attending this clinic for the purpose of having their allergies cured, as far as they are aware. The allergy treatment apparently involves some sort of psychological component, as well as other immunological components that treat them for their allergies. Which is why, after Bunt shows Bond to his room, she talks about how he can't leave his room. There are no doorknobs, you're locked in your rooms because we can't have our patients just wandering the halls, even though it looks like a resort and feels like a resort, everyone's trapped in their own rooms unless they buzz for Grunther to come and let you out of your room, at which point he will walk you around. So even though Hilary Bray is a guest of the Count, he can't just move freely about the facility. She brings him to his room, she informs him of this fact, and she basically is like make yourself at home we will we'll be having dinner at eight Grunther will collect you bond settles in and then as dinner approaches he changes into like a kilt and full kit he's like quite formal there's an amazing shot out of bond's room because they are on location and they used it to great effect of a helicopter flying directly past at eye level <laughs> just uh, yes. flying right past his room it's it's a really cool shot. Notably, I, I actually like it's pointedly flying away, right? Like the key piece of information delivered there is that, oh, the helicopter's not here anymore because we're like we're seeing all this from Bond's perspective and we know he's on an operation. We've just seen one of his potential escape routes go away, stranding him at the top of the mountain. Anyhow, he, he changes into his his formal dinner wear and with the most god awful ruffly shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't like this look at all. It's, you know, it, it is a look and it's very well put together in in classic Bond style. I don't I, I don't like the shirt. It's way too. All of his shirts are too roughly in this movie, but we are on the 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 brink of the 70s. And so this is a, a trend I'm just going to have to choke on. <laughs> okay so bond ascends the stairs from the living quarters and walks into the main room of peace gloria where awaiting him are irma Bunt and all of the patients of this institute who are as previously mentioned an array of beautiful young women all of whom have various allergies he comes in he he is introduced to many of the patients they, they sort of talk to him about how they were affected by their allergies in the past and how the center is miraculous and has cured them. They are now essentially like nearing the end of their their treatment and will be heading home just towards the end of the year, just like heading home for Christmas, basically, once the, the treatment concludes. By way of introduction, only two of these women are actually given names in the movie. Ruby Bartlett who is very 60s in her <laughs> styling. She's played by Angela S Scular. And you mentioned this earlier, and I had not made this connection, that she played Buttercup in Casino Royale. 
Yeah. <laughs> Completely did not make that connection. And I, I, I it, frankly, astonishing that she got a role in this, considering that she'd been in that. <laughs> but I mean, good for her, I suppose. There's a Hungarian named Nancy, played by Katharina von Schell. And then all the rest of the girls are just listed as an English girl, a Scandinavian girl, an Irish girl, an Australian, Chinese, Jamaican, American, Indian, German, and Israeli. And they're all wearing not like comedy stereotype outfits, but they're all wearing costumes indicative of their origin to an extent. Yeah. They're, they all have different regional styling of note the english girl is the first screen appearance of joanna lumley okay who would go on to do god many 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 things in british tv and movies primarily best known as her role of patsy stone in absolutely fabulous ah ab fab darling <laughs> She was also in one of the later Pink Panther movies, The Trail of the Pink Panther, which was an interesting one. This is not a Pink Panther <laughs> podcast. I don't need to get into it. <laughs> Tune in next week for Pink Panther cast. <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, luckily, that that would only ever... Be, oh, wait, no, there was the Steve Martin ones. God, that could still be like an eight-episode podcast that I'm not going to do. <laughs> so we have this scene where Bond and the ladies basically sort of entertain one another. Bond playing, of course, Sir Hilary Bray still at this point and being very sort of stuffy and upper crust, putting on his persona. Just endless, deeply specific trivia about genealogy. Like the man did his homework. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they, they are then, of course, taken over to the dinner tables where everybody chows down. And we, we get an interesting focus on the food. So I mentioned earlier that there's a, a sort of an implication relating to the allergies, which is never really made explicit in the film. Obviously, every one of these women is from a different nation, mm -hmm. for one. And the other thing that, that I find interesting in the focus, the way the scene is cut, they all have allergies to like staple foods. So one of them is allergic to potatoes. One of them is allergic to chicken. One of them's allergic to corn. And we will learn some more about staple foods in a few minutes. But at the moment, it's just, just an interesting thing to note that they are all allergic to staple foods. Mm -hmm. So when you say there's an interesting focus on the food, this is sort of logical extension of some of the stuff I was talking about earlier. I detest this dinner montage. <laughs> <laughs> the way that it is shot and edited is it just really smacks of the director and editor being clever or thinking that they're being clever. Just yeah. it's shot from so many different angles. There's weird, unusual camera angles and strange rapid fire cuts to unnatural camera angles. And it goes on too long and it's disorienting and weird. And I, to what benefit, I'm not sure. In fact, I, I don't think it does benefit the movie. I think it's a detriment. They don't pay it off. That's why I say it's like it's never made explicit by the film is I think there's a reason why these shots exist, but they never actually pay it off in the film. It's only implication. I'm, I'm just going to jump ahead at this point. We will learn later on each of these women is heading back to their own country in order to render a specific crop or livestock sterile and unable to reproduce triggering a worldwide famine they are blofeld's angels of death yeah and i think the implication that this movie serves to me is that each of them is going to be responsible for the staple crop that they were allergic to which is deeply unnecessary oh yeah it's super unnecessary then from a planning perspective the fact that you were able to get 12 women and the implication is, or in fact, they explicitly say that there's more than just these 12, that this is only the most recent batch of Blofeld's Angels of Death, that you were able to get 12 attractive young women in the same sort of age range who all have debilitating allergies and were all willing to come to this weird Swiss hospital on a mountain to be treated for it is enough of a stretch. 
But to then be like, we really need one who's allergic to corn so that we can send her back to corn town and make sure that she infects all the corn. <laughs> right? Yeah, I that maybe that's why they don't pay it off, because it would be stupid. It's very stupid. It's just like, I don't know. Like, I don't know. I'm reaching here a bit, but it's the only explanation I have, right? Like, they could be allergic to anything. There's no no reason why they would all need to be allergic to staple crops. And then the plot ties in again later to the eradication of staple crops. It's like, I feel like there's a line missing. <laughs> mm-hmm. But you're right that it it, it is like yet another suspension of disbelief beyond in order for this to to be true so anyhow this is this is me reading into the film but it's just something i find interesting to like comment on there's also a lot of shots over the course of this montage of the women being taken in by professor hillary bray's amazing stories of genealogy like they're they're definitely paying attention to him because the implication is this is the first man they've seen in a long time and there's one particularly needlessly suggestive shot of one of the women eating a banana (laughs) i forgot about that but then yeah eventually at the end of the dinner it's like okay it's now they do a you know a dissolve to show the passage of time like normal editing would be and they're all still paying attention to his stories all the way at the end of dinner well some are some are the way this dinner goes is Irma Boont picks up on the fact that they are extremely attentive to Bond. And she asks him, it's like, tell us, tell us about your genealogy. Ruby is wrapped the entire time. But by the time the dissolve has finished, half of them are asleep. Yeah. <laughs> They're like slumping in their chair and Bond is still going, going and going and going, talking about genealogy and Ruby has decided to take her opportunity at this point. Look, she knows what she wants and what she wants <laughs> is look, <laughs> she's got needs and she wants some of him. Yeah. So under the table, she pulls out a lipstick, reaches over to Bond who's sitting next to her, tucks her hand up under his kilt and draws a number 8. We don't we don't see that it's an 8 at the time, but she draws a number on his inner thigh with both of them playing it off like nothing is going on bond looking a little dismayed but mostly managing to roll with it and then dinner ends and they're all sent back to their rooms bond does not remain facially motionless during ruby drawing on his thigh irma bunt asks him if he's okay and he says that he just feels a little stiffness coming on pause in the back and shoulders (laughs) That's such a good line. <laughs> <laughs> so after dinner, Grunther takes Bond to meet the Count de Blochamp. And of course, we now have our first meeting of Bond and Blofeld. So at this point, we've we've said previously that this movie discards previous continuity. So as far as we know, neither one of them knows what the other one looks like. They only know each other by reputation. Well, I mean, Bond knows what Blofeld looks like, probably, but not necessarily the other way around. And so Bond meets up with him in in his office in this underground lair. It's a laboratory, like it's a vaccine laboratory from the looks of things. It's an amazing set. There's like a area where they go through like a ice cave, essentially, and then into, yeah, this amazing underground set. The implication is that this is all if, if it isn't actually said outright that much like the scandinavian seed vault which is a real thing in real life that you can google this is being kept so remotely because they're doing such innovative experimental testing with allergens that they want to keep it geographically and temperature wise remote so that you know if something goes wrong then they won't i don't know have some sort of allergy meltdown (laughs) But yeah, uh, Blofeld has this awesome office with huge windows that looks into the lab where they're scientists working on all sorts of different things. There's a surprisingly robust staff here. There really is. It, it like They appear to be running it. Clearly, we know they have ulterior motives, but they do appear to be running it as a lab and developing this treatment. And then after he comes out of the lab and goes through sort of a detox zone with like cool fluorescent lights and everything we get to meet ernst stavro blofeld or as he would rather be known count beauchamp hence the whole reason that professor hillary bray is there 
So this is Telly Savalas, known for his role on Kojak, where he played a detective, Detective Lieutenant Theo Kojak, which uh, ran on TV from 1973 to 1978. So that it actually follows this, but he's best known for playing Kojak, which it's, uh, he always had a lollipop. Hmm. It was just a character affectation that he would just have a have a lollipop all the time. In this movie, he's often smoking. And he plays Blofeld very differently than Donald Pleasance. Donald Pleasance was much more what you think of when people sort of do the the Blofeld parody. You know, they're like, ah, oh, yes, Mr. Bond. Hello. I see that you are here in my evil lair. You know, that's that sort of delivery. Whereas Telly Savalas's Blofeld is a lot more affable, just yes. sort of generally less creepy doesn't have the scar he's just a bald man but certainly there is an undercurrent of unease that you feel from the way that he's playing it 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 basically always feels like he knows more than he's letting on yes yeah constantly sizing bond up yeah I really like his take on the character and his delivery throughout like I I really enjoy him in this role and i think that it's a combination of this movie again being not well regarded in retrospect by sort of general pop culture memory and the fact that honestly his performance is quite understated he doesn't go over the top at all that yeah you just sort of don't really remember his role as blofeld because he he doesn't have all the marks of you know what you expect from Ernst stavro blofeld even though he does have the cat. He does have the cat. And yeah, I, I agree. Like, I, I think this is a really strong Bl- Blofeld. He's sinister in just the right ways. Mm-hmm. And, like unsettling in just the right ways, I think is the word. Because he's not like snidely whiplash evil. He's like cold and calculating evil. <laughs> mm-hmm. So at this point, Bond and Blofeld have a conversation with one another, both of them playing their own respective cover stories. So it's Hilary Bray and Count Beauchamp. Blochamp. Yeah, the man from the College of Arms and the man who would solve allergies. That's right. Basically, the, the whole conversation here is between these two characters talking about the research that Bond is going to do or that Sir Bray is going to do. They have a conversation about the work that he's going to need. Bond tells Blofeld that he's like, you know, I'm going to need some of your time. And Blofeld's like, well, I'm very busy. I'm not going to be able to give you much of my time. Bond basically resolves it by saying, all right, I'm going to go away and do the research with the materials you've provided me. But the fastest way for us to get this all sorted out is if we head to, I don't don't remember the name of the town, but it doesn't matter. It sort of matters. We're, we're going to go to this town where the crypt is for the lineage of the Blochamps. Come there with me. I'm sure it'll be very easy for us to fill in any additional questions that I still have because there's documents and family history there that we can draw on. But I'll, I'll need you to accompany me there. Bond's whole scheme is to get Blofeld out of Switzerland because the Swiss have sovereignty and MI6 can't arrest Blofeld in Switzerland. So Mm. he needs to get him away from his lair so that he can actually arrest him. Right. That's why he's being very, you know, not in a suspicious way, but he's being insistent of like, you know, this will all be a formality. Everything that you've sent me so far is in order. I look forward to seeing this new stuff. But I would like, before we wrap up totally, to take you to this crypt just to, you know, be absolutely certain. Right. Blofeld says something to the effect of like, all right, well, go away and do your thing. And we'll he sort of gives him a like, we'll talk about it, but is noncommittal to the actual decision to do that. And the scene essentially at this point ends with with Bond returning to his his quarters. That's when he reveals that there is a number eight on his inner thigh in lipstick. And we transition to show time passing with a really nice exterior shot. Being able to shoot this all actually on location at the top of a mountain in Switzerland is really cool because like all the interiors of the restaurant during dinner just look amazing. There's just mountains everywhere. And it's like, yeah, you could do that obviously with a green screen and today you would. But the fact that it's not is really cool. You know, we're so Mm -hmm. used to the Bond formula of go rebuild that at Pinewood that it's really cool to see this. Obviously, the ice cave and Blofeld's office and lab, that's all a set. The ice cave is a little apparently a 
this set. It is. It, it looks is a, great, but it's a little apparent. It's a little Scooby Doo, yeah. <laughs> so time has passed. It looks like Bond has been doing the research. <laughs> like certainly, his <laughs> desk has the appearance of someone who's been doing a bunch of research. I assume out of boredom or to keep up appearances in case Grunther comes back. Yeah. But then he sort of looks curiously at the door that, of course, he can't open by himself, picks up his ruler. This is something I remember. Our listeners, depending on your, their age, might not remember this exact style of ruler. But he has one of those wooden rulers with a small metal strip in one side for keeping a very straight edge and so he pulls the metal out of the wooden ruler so then he just has a you know like a foot long very narrow flat strip of whatever metal steel i guess and starts poking around the edge of the door frame until he hits an electric current and shocks himself (laughs) boy does he (laughs) and basically knocks himself back from the door so we get this cute little moment of him like going over to the desk and looking at all of his stationery and trying to figure out a way to pop the door mechanism without shocking himself. He folds an eraser in half and then uses that to hold the metal strip and then clamps that with a bull clip. It's good. I like it a lot. It is good. So he takes it over, runs it around the door again, and the door springs open. And so he heads off, making sure that there's nobody looking. He drops the like key mechanism he's made into his sporan and uh, makes his way down the hall to room number eight and just lets himself in. In room number eight he finds ruby essentially waiting for him to arrive and things go from there yeah because the the cover story essentially is that he's brought a book on genealogy that everyone at dinner proclaimed that they would absolutely be very interested in reading to which irma bunt was like well then he will give it to me and i will give it to each of you one in turn because it will be more fair that way right you know, because they're all like, yes, I could come over to your room and see it. And she's like, nah, going to put a pin in that right now. So he, he comes in, he finds her in bed. She is naked. He, he decides he's going to join her. He starts to undress and we get a reverse shot of him dropping his kilt and uh, and Ruby laughing and saying, ha, it is true. And then we just cut to an exterior shot of the mountain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we cut to some time later and they're both lying in bed but before they can begin round two a thing occurs <laughs> and i'm trying to remember what the thing is oh right the the psychological conditioning yeah it's very strange the thing that happens it's blofeld's system for curing people of their allergies which i don't i'm fairly certain would not actually work is psychological <laughs> conditioning <laughs> i'm pretty certain that you can't just be like you're not actually allergic to chicken you're fine he says that there is a an immunological component to it as well like they are actually giving them medications and treatments but a portion of it and this is partly like this is irma boont's cover story for why they can't talk to each other or see each other outside of scheduled visits is it requires a delicate psychological balance and that delicate psychological balance is the room lights go all trippy and they listen to a subliminal messaging tape of Blofeld talking about their mission like it's essentially a subliminal hypnosis thing that they do it's kind of silly oh it's incredibly silly it's supremely (laughs) silly it's just like Hello, I am Blofeld. You will listen to my voice and do as I say. You're not allergic to chicken. You know, it cuts back to him and Grunther in like a command room with it's just him in front of a bank of 12 cassette tape decks. And he's like (laughs) swapping tapes around like the worst DJ you've ever seen. (laughs) And then so we cut back and forth between that and Ruby, who just immediately knocks out at the sound of blofeld's voice and this like really strange up angle shot of like shirtless george lazenby lit with colorful lights with a psychedelic ceiling behind him and it's just it's a very very strange shot and so bond is like all right well i'm not going to be getting any more out of her tonight and excuses himself while she's having her her treatment Right. He gets back to his room and discovers that he's not alone. (laughs) Yeah. Nancy is there waiting for him. And he looks at her and is like, how did you get into my room? And she 
holds up like a little emery board, you know, like a nail file. I use the nail file. Yeah. I'm like, oh, I see everyone else has worked this out too. And and she, I think she asks after the book. She's like, where's the book? Can I see it? Yeah. And then it sort of like goes from there. Yeah. Cause it's, she's also not really interested in the book. So then she and bon- Bond's been very busy tonight. It's true. So there's like a little through line through all this, that, that, that the way Bond has been playing Bray is a little effect it's oh, it's not actually true. really but there's like there are several instances through this period in the movie or this whole sequence where people make references to the fact that bray is not interested in women yeah ruby says in those many words she's like that was a funny a funny joke at dinner you pretending not to like girls right and then i think nancy also says it she comes looking for the book and he's like oh you do like girls after all and and I don't know. I didn't think he was he wasn't putting on like a particularly stereotypical act. I didn't remotely get that from him. I think it's because he his eyes didn't fire out of his head and his tongue roll across the floor when he entered the room meeting 12 beautiful women. I guess so. Like he managed to stay pretty proper. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe it, like the, the, the first time I met Kathleen, some of her friends from rural British Columbia thought I was gay because I was polite and dressed nicely. So fair enough. Who's to say where their radars are at? But yeah. yeah, I didn't I didn't think he was playing it particularly in that regard, but they certainly thought he was. So anyhow, much to Nancy's surprise, he is totally DTF. And, and they do that. <laughs> the next morning, we're back down at the restaurant and ski lift at the bottom of the cable car up to Pease Gloria, where Sean Campbell, remember him? Bond's like assistant who he never talks to, <laughs> is sort of just like getting kind of antsy and worried about what could be happening up there. So he tries to basically hitch a lift on the cable car. He walks past the door that says, Privat entrit verboten, which I mean, I think, I think <laughs> most people could probably figure out what that means. He's playing up the role of a of an entitled British holiday maker, being like, "Come on, take me up the mountain. I want to go skiing up there. Come on!" And they're like, "No, get get out. Stop. Go away. Be, don't be here. Get the hell out." <laughs> I've I've seen it advertised. Yeah, exactly. I know there's I know there's a restaurant up there. I've seen it advertised. It's like, no, the whole top of the mountain is private. Yeah, which is kind of funny because it's like in the movie, there absolutely is not a restaurant up there. But in real life, there absolutely <laughs> is. Back up top, they're all playing. They're curling on the helipad. <laughs> <laughs> which is OK. It It is a great setup for something that will pay off later. But I they're curling on the helipad. They're they're actually curling on the the like walkway to the helipad because it's a yeah. long corridor that they've that they've iced over. And yeah, that that's basically it. Bond shows up, sees all of this going on, is invited to play. He he throws a stone and falls on his butt. He's he's trying to play it up that he's not remotely a- athletic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Blofeld shows up and Bond talks to him about taking a day off and gets straight told <laughs> it's kind of great actually yeah like he, he basically is like hey, you know I'd, li- I'd like to take take a day off i've been deep in the books and and blofeld is like well clearly you're enjoying yourself now and also the amount you're being paid i think you can probably make do and he's like fair point you know like i yeah. like that the blofeld's like we're paying you a lot of money my guy like no we I want you to do the job that i'm paying you to do and he's like oh you you know you bring up a good point that's fair that scene basically ends but it ends with some of the guards at peace gloria discovering that campbell has been like climbing up the side of the mountain they they take some pot shots at him that of course draws blofeld's attention and sort of in the ensuing noise boon sort of like ushers all of the women and bond sort of back inside we've got a trespasser Everybody go back inside. The game's over. There's there's nothing to see. The guards will deal with it. As the women are passing by Bond, Ruby says, same time tonight, eight o'clock in my in my room. And he's like, yes, yes, no, yes, I'll see you there. And then Nancy is like, I'd like to see you again tonight. And he says, great. How about nine? And then <laughs> the unnamed Chinese girl passes by and he's a sort of is like, 
10 like <laughs> <laughs> just kind of you know filling up the spots on his dance card the important part that happens before bond leaves is that campbell is arguing with the guards being like you know i was just going climbing it's a free country i'm allowed to climb you know where i want to do you can't you know and they're like no this is private property he's like what do you mean it's private property it's a mountain you can't you know you don't get the mountain or whatever and blofeld is sort of like my men are going to hang on to your bag. It's important that we don't have any contamination. They'll send you back down in the cable car. We'll send your bag down later. Please don't ever come up here again. You know, he's still, he's committed to his his role there. And Campbell makes what would be a deadly mistake, which is that he glances over at Bond and then immediately starts capitulating and is like, all right, fine, fine. You know, as soon as he's made contact and has determined that Bond is still alive and well, he's just sort of like, all right, fine, I'll stop arguing and I'll go, which is suspicious. Mm -hmm. It doesn't help that we will find out later at this moment, Blofeld is already either incredibly suspicious or convinced that Dr. Bray is not who he says he is. Yeah, I, I think at this point, based on the information available to him, when he explains literally moments from now, the answer is that he already knows he's not who he said he he is. And upon figuring out who Campbell is, he figures out who is acting as Bray. So they go back inside. Bond walks into Ruby's room and is more or less immediately. He, he is like, hello, <laughs> pulls a sort of like, honey, I'm home kind of moment and is immediately rendered unconscious by Grun- Grunther. Grunther. <laughs> Grunther. <laughs> Sorry, I just love that name. Yeah, it's really funny because again, I have the 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 video here and in the wide shot, like you can tell you wouldn't really ever have noticed this, but you can tell in the wide shot that it is Ruby lying in the bed. And then when he sits down, it cuts to a right. close up and it's actually Irma Bunt dressed in <laughs> Ruby's pajamas in the bed. And she like leaps up and grabs his shoulders and he's sort of like, oh, like he tries to play it off like well, what a surprise to see you here. And then gets just <laughs> hit over the head with like a tire iron or something. <laughs> I forgot about that. It's so good. <laughs> uh, so naturally, he comes to in the office of Blofeld. Now we have our confrontation. The masks are off and we have our confrontation between Blofeld and Bond. In this scene, we basically get laid out everything. Blofeld knows that Bond is Bond. The first mistake that gave him away was that the crypt of the Blochamp family is not in the city that Bond had named. Whoopsies. As a consequence, that gave him away because it was like the one mistake that he made in his information. But Blofeld is sure that the real Sir Hilary Bray would not have made such a mistake. Additionally, a person sent by the British College of Arms and paid the sum that he is being paid would not have undermined his professionalism by, you know, visiting the rooms of their patients. Because they know that that happened. Because they know that that happened. Because of the compatriot who they learn is an agent, it is given away that that it is James Bond. So this is the part where it's a little weird that, like, Bond knows who Blofeld is and indeed has been working with Operation Bedlam for two years to try and track Blofeld down, but that Blofeld has never met James Bond before in person. Or seen a picture of him, apparently. Yeah, it's so odd, considering that like his death was faked with like pictures in the newspaper in You Only Live Twice, <laughs> right? Like Commander Bond, buried at sea. And yeah. that Blofeld doesn't know that this guy, because he's just, he's not even in a disguise when he's Hillary Bray. Like when he showed up, he wore glasses. Yeah, it works for Clark Kent. I guess. <laughs> but then at dinner, he wasn't even wearing glasses. So you do, that is a suspension of disbelief moment. To be clear, I think it is interesting. That is not a criticism for me. It's just like, you know, we talked earlier about like yeah. every movie is like kind of in its own pocket universe and just sort of go with it. Yeah, just just go with it. It it works. There's there are some logical inconsistencies within the universe, right? Yeah. Like he's at the head of a global criminal organization. They can't get a photo of the most famous agent at MI6. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> but like, hey, <laughs> right. sure. 
So anyhow, this is where Blofeld lays out his his entire plan. He, he describes that the women are all his angels of death. Each of them has been tasked with being sent back to their home country, and they have been programmed subliminally through hypnosis, through the psychological conditioning, to wipe out a staple crop, or sorry, render a staple crop or livestock sterile so that it can't reproduce. And uh, that will lead to massive famine and death around the world. Blofeld's plan is, in fact, not (laughs) to do this. His plan is to, uh, it's not even to extort the world in this one. What is the actual, like, his reasoning? He expects the UN to capitulate immediately. He's like, yeah. th- like clearly they're not going to let this happen. And I don't like, I don't want to not have chicken. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't even tell Bond in this scene. Oh, that's right. Bond is like, so what do you want this time? A hundred, hundred million, 200 million. And he's like, no, 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 nothing, nothing like that. You'll, you'll find out later. You don't need to know. He also doesn't tell James how the angels of death will do their thing. He's like, ah, you know what? That's right. I'm not going to tell you everything, which I kind of love because he's like, yeah, I'm not I'm not killing you right now. So I'm going to keep some secrets to myself, which is kind of a wild thing, because it's like, if you think there is a remote chance that Bond might get out of this, you should probably just kill him. If you're like, hmm, he might escape, so I shouldn't tell him literally everything probably kill him <laughs> <laughs> well okay so so it's maybe not top 10 smart villain monologues but it's a solid 11 is what you're saying <laughs> they have very good back and forth to be to be fair i really like telly savalas in this whole scene he does a lot of good work with you know breaking the disguise glasses playing with the tinsel on the tree this is the only bond film that's explicitly at christmas time mm-hmm. and he holds his cigarette in a weird way i don't know i guess telly savalas does a lot of interesting prop work maybe that's why he always had the lollipop when he was in kojak yeah no he, the the way he holds a cigarette is very unique to this character mm-hmm. two of the goons grab him and drag him after blofeld because they don't have like a brig <laughs> <laughs> at their <laughs> research place so they're like well we're gonna keep you alive just you know because you're probably more useful alive than than dead because of i don't know keeping appearances up with mi6 so they take him to the mechanical room for the cable car before he goes in he looks out the window and sees campbell dead strung upside down by mountaineering equipment so campbell never made it back down the mountain once they determined that he was an agent blofeld makes this sort of casual aside of like oh yeah so many climbers what (laughs) what a shame they're not more careful bond sort of snaps and tries to you know he attacks the two guys holding him and like kind of sort of gets the upper hand a little bit it's kind of hard to tell because it's yet another abysmally edited fist fight (laughs) but the end result is that there's I was going to say three of them, but you know, Blofeld doesn't raise a hand here. There's two of them and one of him, and they bundle him into the equipment room and leave him there. Yeah. The one thought that went through my mind is like, they basically tell him, we're going to keep you alive. And then they trap him in this gondola like machine room. All he's wearing is a sweater and slacks. He's at the top of a mountain in the middle of winter in the Swiss Alps in a room open to the elements. Mm-hmm. I'm like, dude's not going to stay alive very long. <laughs> yeah no kidding like it's daytime now but what happens at night yeah so there's a small ledge with an enormous gear on it and a massive pit i mean it's like because it's on the side of the mountain and there's a just a huge drop off so there's a there's a big pit he's on a little ledge beside the door the ledge is covered in gears and the cable runs from the gears across the pit over a gear wheel out a small window basically on the far side of the room and that's all he's got to work with right so there's so there's one big gear that's horizontal there's one big gear that's vertical the big vertical gear is attached to a flywheel that's running the cable and then the cable runs across the room to the wheel that's in the window he hops across the horizontal wheel tries to figure out how he's going to do this before even that i think he actually just waits for it to start and starts his watch to time how long the cable runs when the cable car is going then he starts to try and figure out how he's gonna manipulate this room into 
a way that allows him to escape. He hops over the horizontal wheel and sort of like swings around the gear, the vertical gear, and grabs onto this ledge that's in between the the vertical wheel and the, or sorry, the vertical gear and the flywheel. And he ends up getting like stuck there as the, the cable car runs again, because the cable car is like running constantly through all this. So he's like trying to time his movements, but he ends up stuck like hanging from this ledge for the duration of a run of the cable car. Upon the cable car stopping, he sort of frees himself, hops back to safety, tears the insides of his pockets out of his pants to use his gloves, throws those on his hands, makes his way back over, gets on top of the cable and starts to shimmy along the top of the cable towards the window. And just as he's about to get to the window, the cable car goes again and it starts rolling him back towards the flywheel. This is a pretty, pretty good little tense scene. You're worried about him. And at the last second, he drops off the cable and grabs the ledge again and holds on until the until the flywheel stops. And he goes, tries it again, hops back up, but this time just swinging underneath the cable because he's a little faster that way. Just as he gets to the flywheel at the window, it starts back up again, but he manages to sort of like heave himself over and, and grab the ledge. He manages to sort of get over that the flywheel to the outside and get outside this room. Of course, there's just a drop off on the other side because he's at the top of a like he's on the wires of a cable car. So on a cable car, if you don't know how they work, there are three cables. There's two stationary cables that don't move that serve as tracks for the wheels of the cable car. And then there's a third cable in the middle, and that's the one that moves. And it's attached to the car itself, in this case, at least. And that is the one that provides the motion, like actually pulls the cable or pulls the car up the cables. So he grabs onto one of the the stationary cables so that it won't move him around. And he starts to tr start shimmying down towards a cable car that is coming up the mountain towards him. Again, good tense moment, because if you know how cable cars work, he's holding onto this cable. That the cable car's wheels are about to run over. So he like hangs there until the last possible minute and then drops off, heaving himself towards the top of the cable car and manages to grab onto the ladder at the top of the car before the cable car sort of pulls to a stop in the, the Peace Gloria station. But he has now managed to like free himself and escaped. So this is like it's intercut with the Angels of Death getting ready to leave, too, isn't it? Yeah, I do want to talk briefly about how he is hanging off of the cable as the car is coming towards him. And then five foot blinks to <laughs> being on the ladder on yeah. the cable car. Like he, they make it look like he's swinging towards it, but there's absolutely no way that he would be able to actually make that jump. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I It, it would it would have been more believable if he had landed on the roof of the cable car. Yeah, but then it would have made a noise. But then it I would guess. have made a noise. Yeah. And yeah, the way they filmed that, by the way, is that the stuntman inside the little hand pocket gloves had little hooks that like ran down to like a harness that he was wearing under his outfit. And so it's like he wasn't on like a cable to like a crane or anything. He was literally hanging off the actual cable <laughs> that's incredible yeah just not by his hands it was like hooks attached to a harness but he was still hanging off of it in the snow and the problem is it's cold yeah <laughs> at night and the cable gets icy and when the cable starts going down <laughs> the <laughs> the hooks don't have a lot of friction and so he just starts going <laughs> <laughs> wow and the one of the i think it was one of the camera people at like the first tower was able to like grab him to stop him from <laughs> riding the cables the entire way down oh no <laughs> presumably at considerable speed by the time he got close to the bottom <laughs> just wee. Oh, oh no yeah oh. So yes, the, the scene of all that happening is intercut with all the angels of death getting ready to leave because it's going to be Christmas soon. So they're all dressed up, ready to go. They've got their bags and there's presents waiting for them in the upstairs. And Irma Bunt suggests that they wait until all 12 of them are there and they all open their presents together. 
And when all of them get there, the lights go weird. And then we hear another message from Blofeld. And he's basically like, your training is done. You'll be going home. You know, you will always obey my voice. You know, look inside the present. And they unwrap the present and it's a bespoke makeup kit. And it's all looking very good. He's like, use this compact. He says, every night at midnight, open the compact. It's secretly a radio. I will communicate with you every night at midnight. You know, use the rest of the stuff except for the perfume container or whatever it is that he says, like, except for that thing on the left, do not ever touch that unless I instruct you directly. And so now we know exactly how this is going to work, which is that they're being sent back with a biological agent and that Blofeld will contact them by radio and tell them when to, when to enact the plan, basically. Right. And then they all eventually wake back up and they're like, oh, that was weird. I don't know what happened. And then they all pile into the cable car and head on down. And Bond sees them leave, like he sees them all pile into the cable car because it's just come back up to the top as he's escaping. Right. He sneaks through the interior a little bit. He actually sneaks inside and sees them all wake up and open their presents and everything. Like he's actually in the room, so he knows. That's right. It's kind of unbelievable that no one would notice him, but he's there and he's hiding inside. A little foreshadowing, there's this weird spiky looking wall sculpture that he ends up sort of (laughs) hiding pressed up against and it pokes him out from the wall because it's really spiky and painful as a scientist wanders by that'll come up later but then yeah he heads downstairs in the elevator knocks out the guy waiting at the front desk and drags him into the sort of the the room of ski supplies it's kind of funny because then that's right bunt grunther and all of the girls come down and don't notice that the guy at the front desk is missing (laughs) But Bond ties him up, dresses up in a skiing outfit. So at least he'll be warm and yep. grabs a pair of skis and makes his escape, knowing full well that basically as soon as he hits the slopes, they're going to hear him because there's guards yeah. posted everywhere. Now we get into what is one of my favorite Bond. This is the first instance of it, too, but one of my favorite Bond traditions. Mm. Uh, it only happens a few times, but I am a skier. <laughs> mm. The skiing in Bond movies is rad. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. So Bond hits the slopes. And of course, he's an accomplished skier because he's an accomplished everything. And he starts to ski down the Alps. And as you mentioned, the guards immediately notice they start shooting at him. And then as he, you know, it's like, it's Bond, he's escaping. They all pile on ski gear and, and. Blofeld piles on ski gear and they like an entire crew of goons with with the rifles and and weapons skiing down the mountain after Bond chasing him as uh, as he skis for his life. There's some great skiing in this scene. It's awesome. I love it. It's I, I love it when Bond skis. There's not a lot to talk about in this scene other than the fact that it's just like super sweet skiing for the most part. Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of good bits of, you know, doing good skiing, doing cool jumps, lots of neat cinematography. They're chasing him with a flare. It's just funny to me. I don't know why it's funny. It's really funny to me that Blofeld is out there skiing himself. (laughs) This whole sequence was shot or a lot of it was shot by Willy Bogner, who competed for Germany in the 1960 Winter Olympics. Mm. He He became a filmmaker and ended up working on this movie. This was his first Bond movie, but he also filmed skiing sequences for The Spy Who Loved Me, For Your Eyes Only, and View to a Kill. All the other movies Bond skis in. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> until exactly. like uh, Until Living Daylight. Yeah, he's just like the go-to guy to film skiing sequences, essentially. <laughs> So where where things pick back up again, we just have this great chase sequence is is essentially how it comes down. It ends basically when a rogue bullet hits one of Bond's skis. It doesn't quite end, but it, it is it, it sort of comes to a head when one of one of Bond's skis is shot and breaks and he has to kick it off and ski. He can sort of continues to ski away on on a single ski, which is very impressive. It is very impressive. Certainly much more impressive than when he knocks that one guy off the cliff and it's an extended shot of what is obviously and profoundly a dummy. I love that shot so much though. Slowly Uh. falling to its quote death. Yeah. 
anyhow, yeah, he, he gets caught up. Like he he ends up sort of getting knocked over at the base of a like at the top of a cliff. And as described, he baits a, a guard to follow him and basically clotheslines the guard as he goes over the edge. And we have this ridiculous long shot. I love this shot. It's like it's so obviously a dummy. You're right. <laughs> I love it. It. I love how long it is. I love how interminable the fall is because it's just like the guy goes off and it just. Oh. <laughs> it's like it's like goddamn wily e. coyote it just i can't believe they held it until he hit just with this little puff of snow at the bottom so like things i love in this scene is all you've got is the audio of the guy screaming as he falls and the distant happy music in the little alpen town that's having a little festival Mm-hmm. <laughs> like it's so cheery but also as he's falling just because of the way the lighting is you can see a shadow of this guy on the, the snow and you can watch as they race towards each other as he hit as he comes to the ground and they meet just as he lands it it's so good i love this scene i unironically think this this fall is one of the highlights of this film <laughs> He also strangles a guy to death with a ski. And then he steals his skis and basically just skis down into the village at this point. Upon arriving in the village, they they are still hot on his tail. They know he's he's gotten down to the gotten down to town. This is this is a point in the movie where like Bond is legitimately frightened. Mm -hmm. He's he is on the run, but he is in serious danger and he knows it. His only support has been killed and he knows this. He knows there are dozens of guards scouring this town for him, and and he knows that they know what he looks like. <laughs> mm-hmm. He's like trying to keep a low profile. Thankfully, there's like a little festival happening, so he's like hiding out in the crowds. He walks by a ski rack and steals a jacket and like puts it on to like change how he looks. He gets accosted by a bear with a camera in a great little like jump scare moment. He's like, rah! <laughs> he can see them bearing down on him and like he's not been very successful at avoiding them. Every time he sort of turns a corner, there's another one there that spots him. So he's like having a huge difficulty losing them. There's also the loudest fist fight in any Bond movie <laughs> as he and a guy get into a hand-to-hand altercation in a room full of bells. Oh yeah, the bell room! <laughs> <laughs> here's where we store all of our obnoxious alpen bells yeah hope no one has a fist fight in here <laughs> <laughs> i i watched this movie around i don't know 11 like i started it at like 11 30 at night and there were a couple of scenes that i was like oh god i can't have this be this loud <laughs> 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 and this was one of them i had to turn this one way down after that scene he steals someone's coat so he doesn't look so obvious right. in his bright blue downhill suit and then tries to blend into the crowd at this festival also i want to go to this festival it looks awesome this festival looks rad yeah i just i want to eat all their food they have a they have an entire like row of stalls serving raclette yeah anyhow he, he manages to shake them off enough but even after he gets the coat he gets spotted by somebody like that and they're pretty sure it's him the disguise doesn't manage to help him much so he makes his way over to the skating rink and slumps down on a bench pulls his collar up around his face to try and make himself look more nondescript but they're bearing down on him right like we know they're maybe 50 feet away and walking in this direction and as he's sitting there sort of like trying to think on what he's gonna do He's just looking at the ground as people are skating by and a pair of skates come to a stop right in front of him. And he looks up and who is it but Tracy? Hey, Tracy's back. Where's she been for the last hour? Yeah. And so he immediately relieved to see her is like, hey, he basically cuts right to the chase. Why are you here? Also, I'm in trouble. Do you have a car? Her her answer is, I got a tip from my dad that you were on assignment and and figured out where you were so i figured i'd come here and and try and catch up with you also yes i have a car he's like great take those skates off let's go so she takes the skates off and and they they run to her car and again it's worth noting that the way that she plays this is not like oh my god what's going on she's like what's up how can i help yeah like Like you're clearly in trouble she's like great let's do this this way let's go like she is she's on it (laughs) 
they hop in the car or well they go up to the car and boont and some goons are waiting in a car in the parking lot looking towards where this car is so she goes up to get in the car and bond is like probably planning to hop in the driver's seat but she gets up first sees them and is like no hop in, hop in the passenger side because it's parked next to an embankment and so he's able to sort of like sneak up the embankment and sneak into the car without exposing himself to the people waiting he gets in he's trying to look nondescript but he could not look more suspicious in this shot <laughs> <laughs> He's the most suspicious. <laughs> she backs the car out of the parking spot so that they're stopped immediately beside the goon car. <laughs> and Bond is sitting in the passenger seat trying stone desperately to look forward and not acknowledge the guys in the car next to him with his collar like up over his ears and his head like shrunk down. And the guy in the car next to him sort of looks at him. Then Tracy drives off and they're like, all right, after that car. <laughs> <laughs> he does the worst job of hiding. I believe Bond says, maybe he didn't see me. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, the the plan, where's the nearest post office? I need to get a message out to MI6. And Tracy's like, okay, well, the post office is up here. She drives him along to the, like, the next town over. They find a phone booth, basically. And he, he runs up to the phone booth to try and place a call. And as he's placing the call, some shots ring out and bullet holes riddle the, the phone booth as uh, as it turns out that they've been caught up to by this follow car. So he runs along the embankment. Tracy, seeing that he's in trouble, immediately guns it in the car. He like runs along the edge of this town being shot at the whole way and manages to sort of hop down a flight of stairs and meet up with Tracy. Pops back in the car and she's just like, go, just go. And I, I think he congratulates her. He's like, good job <laughs> mm -hmm. along the way. Then we have like a car chase through snowy roads. Bond directs her to like turn here. And she does. And they turn in to a stock car race. Uh, yeah, which very quickly becomes a demolition derby. It does. Yeah, it's an ice track stock car race. So it's like all Volkswagen Beetles and and minis all these other cars kitted out for a race and they pull into the track and then boots car pulls into the track behind them and they basically like participate in this race for a while as they're rolling around the track trying to like crash the car that's chasing them but also like with no way to escape because it's a closed course and they have they can't figure out how to get out so yeah, there's like a whole bunch of automotive destruction takes place as they they proceed through this race. Tracy, by the way, looks like she's having an... I'm sorry, I'm going to correct that. Diana Rigg looks like she's having an absolute blast because I don't know yeah. if this is in character so much as this that Diana Rigg is having a really fun time. <laughs> I read somewhere that because there are so many close-ups, virtually all of the driving for this scene was done by Diana Rigg. That's correct, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which is kind of ridiculous. There's already a story about how George Lazenby wanted to do a bunch of his own stunts, and they were like, no, you can't. And then he ended up breaking his arm doing something stupid. And so... <laughs> The scene where he arrives in Blofeld's office for the first time, the reason that he has his overcoat draped over his shoulders and not over his arms, and the reason that Grunther removes the coat from his shoulders is because one of his arms is broken in that shot. That would certainly do it. Yeah. So through the course of this race, the Spectre car does crash and Bond and Tracy make their exit. They drive away as fast and as far as they can. As they, as they are driving away, they run out of wiper fluid, which is someone who drives from Vancouver to Whistler on the regular, I can tell you, is a real problem. Mm -hmm. Their windshield starts to basically become inundated with snow. They get caught in a blizzard. They can't clear their windshield. They can't see where they're going. They, they come to a stop, and Bond gets out and notices that there's a farmhouse. He's like, all right, turn in here and we'll we'll just stay the night here. So they they turn in, they wheel the car into the barn, they hop out and spend the night in the barn. There are a few things that happen during their stay in this barn. Bond now fully impressed with Tracy. <laughs> oh, he's been just watching her in this car chase. Just like, like he already liked her, but he's he is legitimately falling in love with her, watching her outpace the baddies in her car. Yeah. He's just like, wow, yeah. you, this she's great. <laughs> <laughs> they settle in for the night. They have some conversations. The main one being that Bond declares that he's in love with her and he proposes to her. He asks her to marry him and she agrees. 
<laughs> then then he does this is such a like contrived setup for this scene but again <laughs> i kind of love it they go to like lie down and go to bed tracy makes some overture of amorousness towards him and bond is like no no that's for the wedding night you know I, i'm i it's my new year's resolution and so like you are gonna sleep over there on this little like hay bale that's like propped up like a little like hay loft kind of thing right propped mm-hmm. two feet off the ground and bond is like you're gonna sleep there i'm gonna sleep down here she's like all right if you say so and goes and and flies down in the hay loft and bond lies down on his little thing and then after not even 10 seconds Bond finds a pitchfork and uses it to knock out the strut in the hayloft, causing it to collapse and her to roll over basically on top of him. And he's like, it's not New Year's yet. So silly. Yeah. We then basically fade to black. The morning brings the various specter goons breaking into the farmhouse, having narrowed down where they could possibly be, seeing Tracy's car there and going, aha, this, this must be where they are. Also noting that the door in the back of the farmhouse is wide open because Bond and Tracy got an early morning and have already escaped from the farmhouse and are tearing down the hill on skis. So more yes. more ski chase. Ski chase part two. Ski chase part two, this time with Tracy in tow. Mm-hmm. They take off. It, this is just another ski chase. There's some, some good skiing in it. Tracy gets some stunts in, which is great. I, I think she remarks something to the effect of like, it's easier than it looks. Blofeld and co are hot on their tails, but not not really gaining on them very well. They make their way over a ridge and down into a bowl, which it turns out will be an error. Prior to that is one of the most grisly moments in any Bond movie. Oh, yeah! Because they oh, jump yeah. <laughs> they jump over a road being cleared by like a big snow throwing truck. And they, Bond and Tracy, leap it and... Most of the Spectre guys leap it as well, but one of them doesn't, biffs into the far wall and falls onto the ground, being run over by the snow clearing truck that just starts firing pink mist out of it out of the top of it. It's it's horrifying. Do you remember what Bond's quip is? Well, he had a lot of guts. Yeah. <laughs> It's oh so, dear oh god but yes yeah. bond and tracy do at that point find themselves in an avalanche area yeah they tip into a bowl in an avalanche area blofeld sees this and basically he has like he has a gun or something like he's got a like something that makes a loud bang <laughs> he has some kind of like he has some kind of boomstick i don't know what it is first of all blofeld is super awful because he's like you know, just in case that doesn't work, he's like, all right, you two stay here. You three keep chasing them, keep <laughs> chasing them down into the avalanche zone that I'm literally about to set off an avalanche in. Go on. And they do. <laughs> yeah. And then, yeah, he it's 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 like a flare gun. It's like a tube. It's like it looks like a flare. Right. And he in fact, it probably it, actually is just an avalanche banger kind yeah, of thing. And it fires off and it does indeed set off an absolutely enormous avalanche so this was the second thing i had to turn down my audio for because it turns out that the audio mix for this has a very deep bass floor and i have a not insignificant subwoofer in my apartment and of course now we're now we're two hours or so into the movie mm-hmm. which i started at 11 30 p.m mm-hmm. and my empire entire apartment is going <laughs> So I had to bring the audio way down on this one. So if you are going to watch this film after listening to this podcast, just be aware. Maybe maybe don't watch this one in quiet hours. The Leicester Square Odeon had to install a new speaker system for the London premiere specifically for this scene. <laughs> It's like, it's really impressive. It sounds amazing. It was recorded in stereo. Yeah, it it is like, I'm sure an actual avalanche is much louder, but the fidelity of it feels very authentic. <laughs> mm-hmm. Do you want to know how they recorded all the shots of Diana Rigg skiing? Because she's going at a fair clip. And there's yeah. many shots where it's clearly her going at a fair clip on skis. Yeah, <laughs> They did it by... <laughs> <laughs> having her kneel on a sled <laughs> that they pulled with a, <laughs> with like a snowmobile amazing <laughs> and this followed they had willie bogner on skis following beside and filming oh that's 
that's amazing. He ended up, by the way, uh, Bogner ended up, who is still with us, ended up doubling for Bond in every one of those movies. Oh, no, he actually, I'm sorry, he didn't double for Bond in this one, but he did double for Bond in all of the subsequent subsequent films. So yeah, an avalanche happens and inexplicably, both of them live, though Blofeld doesn't know that. Yeah, they both basically are like, all right, well, all we can do is try and stay ahead of it. And they go for broke. All of the goons get swept up in it and mm-hmm. they do ultimately get swept up in it, but not until like they are, they've managed to put quite a bit of distance between them and it. So it is already sort of dying off when it catches them. But they, yeah, they do sort of miraculously survive. Blofeld comments as he observes the avalanche with his binoculars, a grave deep enough, I think, to prevent even 007 from walking. But he does spot Tracy from his binoculars, and so he instructs his men to go and retrieve her. Yes. There is a brief shot of 007 unseen to Blofeld, barely regaining consciousness. And then we cut back to MI6. Right. Some time has now passed. Probably not more than a day or two, but a little bit of time has now passed. At this point, Blofeld's plan is in action. He is holding the world ransom. The plan, of course, as described, his patients are going to release chemical agents that will target staple foods. It's at this point that he reveals what his price is. He is holding the world ransom for amnesty for all of his past crimes, as well as recognition of his title. So he wants to be immune for everything he's ever done and part of the nobility. Just wants to retire. Yeah, yeah. Bond is kind of beside himself because Tracy is like he knows Tracy is captured. I love the lighting in this scene because it is, like I said, at the beginning of this episode, this is very naturalistic lighting. Mm. There's no lights on. It's just the light from the windows. And it makes the whole scene look very dour and grim. Mm. And I love M's aside about like snobbery. <laughs> Cause he, 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 <laughs> he's talking down at the notion of the, of how one of Blofeld's demands is the recognition of his title. He's just like, Ugh, snobbery. Yeah. And I just, Ah, God, I love Bernard Lee. He is very good. So Bond is kind of beside himself because he knows Tracy has been captured and is at Peace Gloria and also is like, listen, I know where he is. Tracy has been instrumental in carrying out this operation. We need to mount an assault and a rescue. M is like, no, why would we do that? We can we can make Blofeld go away right now. (laughs) <laughs> by just saying sure mm-hmm. and uh and bond is like no we owe her a debt and and m is like this office is not concerned with your love life bond we are concerned with the safety of the nation the world he says the un is says absolutely not you can't no you don't get to do anything it's done it's over go home so at this point bond does not go home well he goes home but he well he does go home but <laughs> yes he he does not go home for good he uh he goes to to draco and asks to organize a quote demolition job draco gets some some goons together and arms them and fleet of helicopters which they describe they disguise as red cross helicopters mm-hmm. which i'm pretty sure is a war crime yeah actually wait (laughs) hey (laughs) well draco's a criminal um yeah (laughs) yeah so anyhow well i just love i i love this by the way that bond is like well hey draco i know where your daughter is and we're gonna go save her and also the world so let's do this i i just i i i love that this comes back that that plot thread comes back and that yeah bond is like okay well then i'm gonna do it myself you know i yeah it's i i, I like this a lot there's a bunch about the whole draco storyline that i like even yet to come but the like very very easy probably to convince the leader of an international crime syndicate to dethrone the leader of yet another international crime syndicate who has your daughter kidnapped yeah yeah. Uh, <laughs> so anyhow, they they hop aboard these helicopters to fly in with their assault team to Peace Gloria. There's a series of scenes where the radios like there's the radio conversation that happens where it's like, listen, you're unidentified helicopters in restricted airspace. Identify yourself or we will put you down and, and they play it silent. And then Draco comes up with the cover story. It's like, no, this is a humanitarian mission to Italy. We are delivering supplies, like medical supplies. They're like, no, you're going to set down so that we can inspect you. He's like, listen, there was a there was a landslide in Italy. 
what the hell is wrong with you? Just let us go. And they like dispatch a fighter jet. They they finally come out as like, listen, my passengers are like, you're scaring my passengers. What the hell? Check with air control or whatever. You've got out of date information. We filed our air plan. And then they're like, you have passengers? He's like, of course I do. I've got doctors. <laughs> like, what? What's wrong with you? And members of the international press. Oh, and members of the international press. That's right. And uh, they're like, all right, fine. Just make, you know, proceed straight and do not divert from your course. They proceed straight up until the point where they're near Peace Gloria and then they divert course and assault the base, much to the, the horror although not totally to the surprise of the people at Peace Gloria. And then there's just a big action scene. We have a big mountaintop action scene that is kind of called, like, not called back to, but certainly, I think, influenced the mountaintop action scene in Inception. I, in fact, did have to look up to see if the installation in Inception was the same one that they used here for exteriors. It's not. If I may quote from the retrospective reviews section of the On Her Majesty's Secret Service Wikipedia entry. Sure. Director Christopher Nolan has stated that On Her Majesty's Secret Service was his favorite Bond film in describing its influence on his own film, Inception. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> there's, there's a great little sort of back and forth in the scene because Blofeld is trying to woo Tracy, essentially. And she's being pretty cold about it, understandably. And then when she overhears her dad being the one bullshitting his way through this radio call, then she basically calls Blofeld away from the control room and is like, okay, tell me more about Tell me more about this plan. I, you know, tell tell me more about you. So she basically distracts him away from it. Right. Which I really like. And then, yeah, we get this amazing shot again on location, this amazing shot of the the windows of Pia's Gloria with these three helicopters outside. <laughs> and it's it's a, like it's a legitimate shot. It's just like, oh, crap. Look at them coming. There, there are some great shots of the helicopters in it. Like this whole scene is like quite impressive visually there is one wide shot where they transition between two different shots and so there's like a helicopter that like dissolves into <laughs> shot i'm i'm sorry to to ruin this for anybody it's a, <laughs> it's a two hours six minutes and five seconds but it's like the one helicopter like vorps forward in a dissolve <laughs> as another dissolves into shot you know don't worry about I it i noticed anyway. that too i oh, so good. i thought it was a cut but it, you're right it's a dissolve yeah but i i noticed that too where it's like it's in one place and then it just looks like it jumps forward yeah it's very very okay. strange cool i didn't imagine that yeah <laughs> i no, thought that was are... a skip in the in the file i was watching but <laughs> nope okay nope all right i watched the movie good tracy attacks her two captors with a champagne bottle <laughs> yes and like is legit scary in the process <laughs> it's so good she attacks her two captors makes her way downstairs blofeld runs away to his basement lab everyone's d diving out of helicopters to attack the place lots of big noises and gunfights oh here's the 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 payoff for that curling thing you were talking about earlier which apparently was lazenby's idea on set it's awesome so good for lazenby <laughs> He penguin slides along the curling <laughs> ice, firing his gun at the bad guys. <laughs> penguin slides. It, what else are you going to call it? He's on yeah. his belly, <laughs> sliding across the ice towards the bad guys, like laying into them with his gun. It's super sweet. Mm -hmm. I think it's rad. Tracy uses the metal room divider thing to basically like grab Grunther's arm through it because it's like this open metal room divider, yanks him towards her so that he hits his head on it and is rendered unconscious and tumbles down the stairs. And then she has to get past him to leave, at which point he stands back up because he's not actually unconscious, grabs her and they struggle a bit. And here's the payoff for that weird spiky wall sculpture <laughs> as she spins around and backs him onto it, impaling him on this terribly dangerous sculpture. Yeah. So Tracy takes out Grunther. It is truly Chekhov's spiky wall sculpture. Because <laughs> it's it's like that feature is <laughs> is hanging there the entire movie. It's and so it's such conspicuous. a weird, conspicuous, spiky sculpture sculpture that you just from minute one, the moment it appears on screen, you're like, oh, somebody's gonna die to that. 
And lo and behold, they do. And so good. They are reunited. The The fight happens and Tracy is reunited with her father. And there's a like a conversation that takes place where she doesn't want to go because Bond is still missing in this base somewhere. Bond is in the base. He's gone after Blofeld. He's trying to chase him. Draco is like, no, you're you're leaving. And she's like, well, I'm not going to leave him behind. He's like, yes, you are. And he punches her out cold and puts her on the helicopter and and comments spare the rod spoil the child as he as they're loading the now unconscious tracy into the helicopter and one of the one of the other goons or one of the the good goons comments like what about the englishman and draco is like he knows the timetable a bond misses the exfil and the helicopters take off without him Obviously, I feel conflicted about Draco just decking his daughter. It's curious because in any other Bond movie with, frankly, less competent co-stars, it would be very tropey. Like, okay, you're getting the incompetent love interest out of danger in the final fight. Tracy is very competent and we have seen that. So like that aspect doesn't hurt as much, but it is like but I want to see her stick around and do competent things. Yeah, it's it's a bit of a rough exit. Yeah, there's also the the thing of like, but she is so good and competent that the only way that they would be able to get her out of here is her dad clocking her. <laughs> it's, I don't know. I would have preferred they find a different way to do it. But now Bond is the only guy left on the mountain. Well, the only good guy. There is a scientist who just hurls a like... <laughs> <laughs> flask of something at him that melts through glass very strange the one thing that we haven't commented on so far is that during all this some of the good henchmen have been rigging the entire place with explosives yes they are going to blow this place to high hell and bond has to do what he needs to do before then which is find out where all the angels of death are so he goes back to blofeld's office and there's a section of wall that raises to show a secret map behind it, which the audience and Bond only saw very briefly, just as it was closing, as Bond was regaining consciousness in Blofeld's office. So the fact that Bond remembers that is very impressive. Mm -hmm. He finds the secret button to raise it up, and it's covered in little flags of where everyone's been sent. And so he pulls out a little camera and takes pictures of the whole thing so that they know where everybody is and can find out where these women are so they can be dealt with, basically. Blofeld sees Bond doing this and tries to shoot him, but misses. Blofeld misses. Bond is still alive. Blofeld turns and runs. Bond runs after him. As they are sort of like making their escape, the installation begins to explode. Blofeld, in his attempt to escape, as the like things are starting to come down, he makes his way to a bobsled track I'm a little unclear on the geography of this and how this was so close to Peace Gloria. <laughs> he he ran out the mount he ran out of the installation and halfway down the mountain to where the yeah, no, the the geography is not acknowledged in the film. But on the upside, cool bobsled chase. Yeah, we get a sweet bobsled chase. So I I love the fact that they both put helmets on. <laughs> they both stop and put on helmets and goggles. <laughs> Which, you know, good on them. But fleeing for his life, Blofeld hops into a bobsled, throws a helmet on and pushes it off. Bond, not wanting to be left behind, hops in a bobsled, throws a helmet on and pushes it off. And uh, we have a sweet bobsled chase as Bond is trying to catch up with Blofeld by bobsledding faster than Blofeld is. And Blofeld is trying to make Bond's life difficult. And, and so we have some sort of like Ben-Hur style, like bonking bobsleds on the track as they race down it real fun starts when when blofeld pulls out a grenade <laughs> <laughs> lucky he had that on him yeah blofeld pulls out a grenade and holds it by the pin in his mouth as he's trying to like get the steering cables into one hand so that he can control the bobsled while throwing this grenade naturally the motion of the bobsled and the weight of the grenade causes the grenade to drop off the pin and arm before rolling into the front of his bobsled, which then causes his, causes Blofeld to like frantically hands around in his bobsled to try and get this grenade before it goes off. He manages to get it, hurls it back over his shoulder 
into the the bobsled track, which blows up just in front of Bond's sled, wrecking Bond's sled, knocking him clear. Bond, apparently surviving this, mounts up over the wall of the bobsled track and runs because there's a curve. And so he takes the short straight across the curve to get ahead of Blofeld and cut him off and leaps down into Blofeld's bobsled. And he manages to just sort of grab onto the rails at the back or the handles at the back and hold on and try to pull himself into the sled. And then then we have a bobsled born fist fight as they hurtle down this mountain as Bond is trying to like muscle Blofeld and Blofeld is trying to knock Bond off the back of the bobsled. We get a great scene where the bobsled goes like up on an angle and Blofeld manages to press Bond's helmet into the ice wall and we can hear it like grate along the ice wall. This all comes to an end when Blofeld manages to get position on Bond and he gets over top of him. You know, Bond is is looking to be in pretty dire straits, but just in time, he manages to get his feet under Blofeld and push him up, causing Blofeld to have his head caught in the nook of a tree branch, like Oof. a Y, which yanks him by the neck out of the sled and leaves him hanging from this tree branch in the background. Bond then tries to get a hold of the, the bobsled, but ends up, like the bobsled ends up crashing and he gets thrown clear of the bobsled track. And a big St. Bernard comes over and says hi. And a big St. Bernard comes over and says hi, which Bond complains to about the fact that he didn't bring him any brandy. And then we dissolve to a very brief scene shot from a long lens of Bond getting out and going into a jewelry store. And then we transition to the wedding of James Bond and, well as it's announced, Mr. and Mrs. James Bond, because of course it's the 60s, but Bond and Tracy in Portugal getting married. And everyone's there. I, God, I love this. I love this scene. I love Money Penny in blubbering tears. <laughs> it's so good. I She's love so good. Draco and M in their respective roles as essentially the father's because yeah. Emma's basically being James's dad here, talking about, like, Draco's like, ah, it's great to talk to the man who cost me three of my best operatives. And Em's like, oh, yes, yes, during the Italian affair. Yes, you got away with quite a haul from the, you know, talking shop. <laughs> As adversaries. MI- <laughs> yes, the head of MI6. Yeah. God. This was what I was said, saying when I was like, I love how the Draco plot comes back. Because, yeah, he's like, Bond is marrying into a crime family, and Draco and M as, like, the head of MI6 and the head of, an, like, a national crime syndicate, just, like, chewing the fat over, like, their various misadventures through the years, trying to get yeah. one up on one another. It's a little grim, actually, but it's, it's like, it's super fun in this, in, in context. All the recognizable henchmen from earlier in the movie are there applauding. There's a bit where Q is like, basically like James's uncle who doesn't really know what to say. He's like, look, you and I haven't always, well, look, you, if you ever need anything, you, you let me know, you know? Yeah. Then there's an exchange with Money Penny where he throws her his hat and, and she she grabs the hat, just holds it really tight, bending it in tears. Yeah, she sort of mashes it. Yeah. This, by the way, this is the last time that he would do the hat throw for many movies. Mm. And then Q comes over and sort of <laughs> briskly snatches the hat back from her, commenting that Bond has no respect for <laughs> company property. <laughs> <laughs> And then with flowers, God, so many flowers draped over the road and a huge crowd of people, they drive off into the sunset. They do. Which is where Peter Hunt thought this movie would end. Because the plan, of course, was that George Lazenby would come back for another Bond movie. And so this was shot that it could end there. And then the rest of this movie would be shown at the beginning of the next movie. Makes sense. Like it may that makes total sense. On the one hand, what a downer of a start to the next movie, though. Yeah. Yeah. But instead, we get a real downer to the end of this movie. Yeah. (laughs) Because they're driving away and a car full of party kids who's actually the same. I believe it's the same group of party kids 
that from the beginning of the film drive by his car at the beginning of the film comment about like you know like oh you you where's the florist or something they make some sort of joke about how their car is covered in flowers and so bond's yeah. like oh that's i guess we do stick out a bit you know and he gets out to sort of deflower their car i don't know why i'd be like hell yeah i just got married <laughs> taste <laughs> it like i wouldn't take the flowers off but whatever you know so they're being cute and adorable while he's doing that. And a car comes over the ridge behind them. They, there's a conversation that takes place in the car between Tracy and Bond. Like the, there's some implication to the wedding and the like send off and all that Bond may or may not actually be retiring at this point. There's also I forgot to mention at the wedding draco hands bond an envelope presumably with the that million pounds that he promised him earlier and bond right draco puts it directly into bond's inside pocket and bond takes it back out puts it back in draco's inside pocket and is like no no i told you i didn't want your money yeah so anyhow they they have a conversation where they start making plans for the future and it's like it's all right we've got you know we don't have to make up we don't have to make up our minds right now we have all the time in the world then they stop and the black car rolls up the road behind them and we see that irma bunt is in the back seat and the car is being driven by blofeld wearing a neck brace and they drive by the car and fill it with bullets bond is unharmed and tracy has been shot right through the head yeah this scene is brutal this scene, like this scene is just devastating yeah he runs around the car and gets in and comments to tracy it's like all right we like it's it's blofeld again we you know we gotta go we gotta go after them and she doesn't respond and he then he sort of like looks over and there's a bullet hole through the window the camera shows her face and there's a bullet hole in her head and blood trickling down her face at that point you basically just watch bond break in real time (laughs) she slumps over onto his lap as a policeman on a motorcycle drives up behind and basically sort of peers in. I don't even think the policeman has, has any dialogue. He just sort of is checking that they're okay. Mm -hmm. And I mean, anyone who doubts George Lazenby needs to just see this scene when he's just like, he just says, Oh no, no, it's, it's fine. It's fine. She's just resting her eyes. It's everything's fine. It's all going to be all right. We have all the time in the world. It's soul crushing. It is. And the the movie ends with the, the camera focused on the windshield, with the bullet hole in it and just fades to silence. And then and, <laughs> and then, then the credit roll starts. Like it's really, <laughs> really, really awkward tonal shift as the uh, James it Bond is. theme comes in. And yeah, then, yeah, it's it's brutal. It's really good. Like the performances yeah. are incredible. And it's like it is uh, the James Bond movie movie made me feel an emotion that wasn't either <laughs> things are exploding or oh hot. Like the, the there's actual emotional resonance to this scene. It's it's really good. The fact that Blofeld is in it <laughs> is a problem for the movie as a whole because it immediately undercuts the fact that we just watched Blofeld die so it like it makes a ton more sense that this would have been the opening to the next movie but man I'm not sure I would have wanted to have watched that movie either (laughs) (laughs) yeah (laughs) I want those opening scenes to like prime me for an awesome time not ruin my entire day yeah I forgot what a crushing end this this movie has no other one would do anything quite like this yeah so there we go that's on her majesty's secret service the longest bond movie certainly our longest episode (laughs) (laughs) i don't know what you're talking about graham what do we think this movie rules this movie rules so pre-title sequence pre-title's tricky for me because it has a lot of good stuff in it it has that little fourth wall break. It never really pays off exactly why Tracy is trying to walk into the sea. And it has that fight scene that's really jarringly edited. It has a lot of stuff that I kind of dig. I don't know. I think once you sort of shake everything out, it's kind of in the middle for me. Okay. What do you think? 
Oh, I think it goes below Thunderball. There, there's lots of stuff that I dig, but for the same reasons you've mentioned, the like the fight scene is terrible. The scene doesn't make a whole, or at least the conceit of the scene doesn't track very well. What works in it works, but what doesn't work in it really doesn't work in it. And it's also just one of the least exciting ones that we've had that, mm-hmm. of the ones we've had. I, I think it goes above Doctor No for obvious reasons, <laughs> but I, I think this is a weaker pre-title scene. Yeah, I think I'm on. I think I actually agree with you on that one on the on the positioning of of Below Thunderball. I think our pre-title power rankings are still completely in step with one another they are yeah so far music however now this is now (laughs) because we were talking about this in casino royale are we talking about the lewis anderson we have all the time in the world notice the name again ouch or the on her majesty's secret service main theme so technically in the tracking document i have this listed as title because my previous esti- estimation of what this ranking was going to be was going to be the opening credit sequence all up. I think that will be easier to do long term, but that does require a synthesis of the banger of a title song and the somewhat of the graphical treatment. So up to you. I, I think we go with with OHMSS as the title song for this one. All right. Because I love this soundtrack. Oh, yeah. But I don't like these titles. I know that <laughs> I, I know that you like them more than I do. I still wouldn't put them very high. They're in the middle for me. If we're looking at just the music, like just the song, this is probably number two behind Goldfinger for me. Mm. Possibly even with an asterisk of just like, this actually just rules regardless. <laughs> like this... <laughs> This might secretly be a number one just because I can kind of listen to it whenever without someone going, is that a James Bond theme song? Like, it's it's just <laughs> awesome. Yeah, I'm 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 very bullish on the theme song to OHMSS. OK, I, I I'm willing to just call title the title song. The one caveat being that now that we are locking in on the title song, that it is the song used in the titles or the right. song that bears the title of the film. Right, so we have to... Because they're not always the same. But. We have to retroactively uh, rework Casino Royale because of the... <laughs> I'm not going to worry about it. We okay. don't have to go back. <laughs> Ever forward. But I like OHMSS and We Have All the Time in the World. I think We Have All the Time in the World is a great song too. Yeah. Particularly in context, but it, it like it's a really good song. Speaking of Casino Royale, I don't think I mentioned that the lyrics for We Have All the Time in the World were written by Hal David, who also wrote the lyrics for The Look of Love. <laughs> Well, I mean, if you're a working lyricist of the era, I guess. Yeah. I'm going to put mine in the same place you did with probably the same caveats. I could listen to OHMSS anytime because mm-hmm. it's a rad song. It is a song that I would rather listen to than Goldfinger, frankly. Yeah. Goldfinger is a better title track just by nature of how iconic it is. I This song is pretty iconic, too, but I think it suffers for the relative lack of exposure that this movie has among the other films. But yeah, I'm, I'm going to make this my number two title track as well. Wow, which brings us to the film as a whole. Gosh darn it. This is a great movie. Sure is. I already know where it's going for me. Where's it going for you? It's going number two behind From Russia With Love. Yeah, that's solid. I think this is my favorite so far. Ooh, I think this is right. my number one. Like it's honestly just, there's so many things and it's it's... God, I wish the fight scenes weren't edited so badly. <laughs> yeah, I think with only a few small changes, this movie would easily vault to my number one. But the things that hold it back hold it too far back. No, I yeah, I can I can totally see that. But damn, I it's just really good, and I think it. I think people should watch this. <laughs> I think yeah. people should watch this movie. It's just yeah. good. If you've put this one off, it's like Tokyo Drift. If you've put this one off because you've heard it's the bad one, you should give it a chance. <laughs> exactly like Tokyo Drift. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, there's another Bond film way later that people might also have heard is the bad one. And I'm confident that it is still the bad one. Oh, yeah. But, I know which one you're talking yeah. about because it is definitely the bad one. <laughs> but this one is... <laughs> not the bad one it is great yeah no this movie rocks there's no one in it that i'm like everyone's great except for that person like lazenby rig savalas all the supporting cast draco's great everyone mi6 is great grunther does his job well you know (laughs) the actual sir hillary bray is great in his part everyone's really good at the part they're playing god tracy's so good yeah 
And so competent. Yes. Which is a very low bar, but a bar that not a lot of the Bond movies meet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So the one last point of order we have to work through here. Yeah. I'm pretty sure if you'd asked me like three days ago, I had one queued up and ready to go. Now that we're a few days on, it has completely evaporated from my mind. I was thinking about this while watching the movie. I'm like, oh, that's going to be it. Is it his quip to Draco after throwing the knife? Oh, it definitely is. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yes. Okay. I thought that might be yours. Yes. It's so good. The perfect play of what was maybe a mistake we don't know because he's just that good yeah i mean i mean i i mentioned it because i think i'm right there with you like uh, that's all right that's just a really excellent moment of that whole scene like the the fight and then breaking in and being like all i have is this knife but i'm ready for whatever's going to be in here and then disarming himself voluntarily and then that quip it's great all right that sums up all orders of business yeah i wish george lazenby had done another movie me too but instead next time we get diamonds are forever with the return of sean connery so i'm looking forward to that because i i haven't seen that one in a long time and looking at it through the lens of this podcast i'm very curious to see how it holds up me too that will do it for this episode this extended episode of from rewatch with love until next time matt thanks always so much for this and thank you, Graham. Shout outs to Matt Griffiths for the video version, Heather for podcast admin, and thank you all of you because this show, as everything we do, is brought to you by you and your kind support of our Patreon at patreon.com slash loading ready run. This podcast will return. Mm-hmm.